Good morning and welcome to the Planning and Placemaking Committee of the 22nd of March 2023. I'm Councillor Ian Massey, convener of this committee. I'll now introduce you to the top table. To my extreme left is my vice convener, Councillor Grant Stewart. On my right is Mr Christian Smith, Development Management and Building Standards Service Manager. Second right is Team Leader Sean Panton. Extreme right is Team Leader Paul Williamson. To my left is Mr Colin Elliott, Legal Manager. And second left is Miss Jessica Guild, Committee Officer. Moving on to housekeeping. As this is a hybrid meeting, members joining virtually are reminded that if you leave the meeting during consideration of any application, you are unable to participate or vote on that item when you return to the meeting. This also means that if a member loses their internet connection during the consideration of an item, they should not vote on that item. Please advise the clerk via the meeting chat that you are leaving the meeting or if you have lost your connection and are therefore unable to vote on the item. And whilst we are operating as a hybrid meeting for the proceedings today, can I remind councillors and officers to use the chat box to attract my attention, which all members should have access to. Q for question, C for comment. I will now ask the clerk to confirm any apologies and the attendance of those in the chambers and online. Thank you, convener. We have apologies from Councillor Drysdale with Councillor McPherson substituting and apologies from Councillor Waters with Councillor McCall substituting. We have a couple of members present online. I will ask them to confirm they are here. Councillor James. Morning, present. Thank you. And Councillor Reid. Present. Thank you. All other members are present in the chambers. Thank you, Ms. Gill. Uh, we now move on to declarations of interest. Are there any declarations of interest? If there is a declaration, please put DI in the chat. Councillor Braun. Yeah, thanks, Convener. I have uh, a non financial interest in items 423 and 424. So, with your permission, I'll withdraw from the chamber on those two. Thank you. No more. Right, move on. Uh, the minutes of the Planning and Placemaking Committee, 22nd of February 2023. Can we agree the content of this minute? We went on to deputations. We have deputations today. Can we agree deputations on items 411, 421, 423 and 424? Thank you. Now move on to major applications. And this is for the erection of 71 dwelling houses and 32 flats, uh, approval of matters and conditions 1700939 IPL, phases 1B and 2A MU5, land 200 metres west of Blair Gowrie and Rattery Cottage Hospital, Perth Road, Blair Gowrie. And uh, uh, can I ask uh, Mr Panton to speak to the report? Thank you. Thank you, convener, and good morning, councillors. As stated, the first item on the agenda today is for the erection of 71 dwelling houses and 32 flats to the southwestern edge of Blair Gowrie. The site is allocated in the local development plan as MU5 for a mixed use development. Planning permission in principle for a mixed use development for the entire MU5 application was approved in December 2018. The site therefore benefits from both an LDP allocation and planning permission in principle. The development is to be delivered in phases. Phases 1A is currently under construction with two of the retail units now operational. These are occupied by Lidl and Home Bargains. This current application forms phases 1B and 2A. I will now take the committee through a short presentation detailing the proposals. Next slide please. This first slide shows the location of the site. As seen, the site is to the southwestern edge of Blair Gowrie, immediately adjacent the A93 Perth Road. It extends to approximately 5.5 hectares and is mainly rough grassland, with a small area of woodland in the southern end. The area to the east across A93 is predominantly residential. The area to the south 
although not evident on this aerial image, is an earlier phase of the development which is now under construction. To the west is an area of ancient woodland and to the north is more rough grassland. The site is bisected by a sandy road which runs in an east-west direction through this development phase. Next slide, please. This plan shows the development phases. Phase one is shown in red, phase two is shown in blue, and phase three is shown in green. Ascendi Road is a road which bisects phase one and phase two. Next slide, please. This slide now shows the exact location of phases 1B and 2A. This is the area subject of this current application. Next slide, please. Here we have the proposed site plan. In this development, in total, there are 103 units proposed. The orange units to the right of Ascendi Road are for private sale. The grey units and the orange units to the left of Ascendi Road are affordable units. 73 of the 103 units proposed as part of this application will be affordable units. This equates to 71% of the development. This is significantly higher than the 25% requirement from Policy 20. This has been done to take account of the wider site allocation. As applications are made for future development phases, this figure will be rebalanced back towards the 25% requirement. Next slide, please. Here we have some site sections for the western end of the development. You can see here how the topography of the land will be accommodated. Next slide, please. Again, we have some site sections, this time at the eastern end of the development. In the top section here, you can see the Suds Basin. Next slide, please. Here we have a typical house type elevation. The house type shown is a detached three bedroomed unit. Next slide, please. Now we have a typical cottage flat plan. This building accommodates six two bedroomed units over two storeys. No building on the site will exceed two storeys. We will now move on to a series of photographs to give members a greater context of the site. This first image shows the site when viewed from the A93 Perth Road. The access to phase 1B will be taken from between the traffic light on the immediate right and the white building in the far distance. Next slide, please. This next photograph is taken from approximately the same location as the last image, but now looking from the A93 into the development site itself. You can just make out the Suds Basin as part of Phase 1A to the far left of the shot. This will be shown in greater detail in the next slide. Here we have the Suds Basin in greater detail, with the development site beyond. The path on the right of the image is both a core path and a right of way. This path will lead into the development site and will, and will require slight re-diversion to take account of the new road layout. Conditional control is recommended to ensure that this is done appropriately. Next slide, please. We now move towards the upper sections of the site. This is Ascendi Road with the area to be one phase 1B to the left of the road and area 2A to the right of the road. Next slide, please. This photograph again shows a sandy road, this time looking southwards towards Blairgowrie. You can make out an existing house on the Perth Road to the top right of the image. Next slide, please. This final image shows the area to be phase 2A with the residential properties on West Park Road visible in the distance. Next slide, please. Thank you, convener. That now concludes my presentation. I will leave members with the proposed site plan for reference. Thank you for that, Mr. Panton. Uh, we do have deputations on this one, so I will now hand over to my vice convener for the deputations procedure. Thank you. Thank you, convener. Um, can I call on Ms. Russell? We appear not to, these are going to be deputations done over the phone, so we'll just give it a few seconds in case they're trying to dial in.
just to make members aware, we are trying to make contact with the deputations. Um, we were expecting people to call in at half past nine, so we're just double checking that they um, have tried to contact us. OK, we have a busy morning, uh, so I think we're just going to move on. So I'll hand back to the convener. Uh, thank you. Uh, Audrey, can I just make sure that you've tried to contact both the deputations and you're not getting any answers? Right, thank you, Audrey. Right, we'll move on. Uh, can I ask members if they have any questions for officers? Councillor James. There's a surprise, eh, convener? Um, thanks very much, convener, by the way. Um, Mr. Patton, I'm, I'm looking at the uh, the papers we've got before us, and there's a couple of things on page 16, uh, paragraph 62. Um, there's something about uh, a provision of a pedestrian control crossing on Essendon Road. Um, will that be near the junction? Because uh, uh, the only reason I'm asking is because the junction out onto the main road is very difficult to get out of at the best of times, and I just wouldn't want that to hinder. Um, access out onto the main road uh, from Essendon Road. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor James, and good morning. Um, yes, Condition 5 is worded in a way that they'll have to liaise with our colleagues in roads to come up with a suitable location for this crossing. So we will be making sure through the wording of Condition 5 that a suitable location is identified that's both um, suitable for road safety and pedestrian movement. Thank you. Councillor Brown. Thanks, uh, convener. <clears throat> I have a, a number of questions, but if I may, I'll just start with one. Um, it's just to clarify a point on the on the plan uh, the, to the left of Essendon Road, which is the south, but to the left of that, am I right in saying they are all affordable housing? Thank you, Councillor Braun. Yes, that plan that's on the screen to the right of Ascended Road, all those units in orange, they are the private sale. Um, and on the left of Ascended Road, they will all be affordable um, units. Like I say, it's, it works out at approximately 71% of this development, but that will be rebalanced out as future phases come forward. But yes, you're correct. To the left of Ascended Road is all the affordable units. Bailey McLaren. Yeah, good morning. Thank you. My question is more about uh, the roads adoption post um, the construction of the units. I see it's phased. It's a phased development. So will the roads be adopted in a phased style as well? Because if it's a larger development, this could take quite a number of years if they're not in a phased style. Thank you for your question. Again, the, the matter of adoption is, is between the developer and our own road service. In effect, the developers would require to uh, undertake construction of roads to the standard required and then seek the council to have them adopted, at which point the council will take responsibility initially for winter maintenance and then after a period uh, of review, uh, at least 12 months, uh, the council would then determine whether or not they could adopt them. But until that point in time, responsibility for condition, construction standard, etc. would lie with the developer. Uh, but yeah, you would expect that 
roads would be constructed, completed, uh, go into maintenance periods and then be adopted in a manner that would reflect the phasing of the development. Mr McLean, do you want to expand on that? Thank you, convener. Um, I think Christian covered all the points there, but yes, um, depending on how the, the applicant decides to um, submit their RCC applications, um, I would envisage it being a phased approach, um, particularly with the phase on the left um, possibly coming forward first, um, and then the phase on the the, the right coming forward um, laterally. Um, it would make sense to do them as uh, two separate applications, um, and then we can proceed with adoption um, thereafter um, once it's it's met our requirements. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor McCall. Thank you, convener. Could I just get some clarity on the affordable housing? Uh, are these all for sale? If you just bear with me, Councillor McCall, I'll direct you to the relevant paragraph. Thank you. Sorry about that. Just wanted to check there. So yes, in paragraph six, you'll see that 34 of the 73 units will be for social rent and 39 of the units will be mid-market rent properties um, for the affordable side. Councillor Braun, you have another question. Sorry, I've got a few actually, but I'm just trying to break them up. Uh, this comes back to, to roads on this one. There's two, two points on this. I just wanted to clarify on the map now to the right, um, there is no access to the main road via West Park Road. It, it appears there it isn't. Um, and obviously all the future development will be coming through uh, the road marked onto s &D Road. So there's no access through West Park Road at all. That is a very difficult turn there. So I'm going to clarify that first of all. Mr McLean. Thank you, convener. Um, yes, um, my understanding is the same as yours and um, that there will be no access um, for vehicular traffic um, along West Park Road there. Um, there will be um, pedestrian access and cycle access through there, um, but no vehicular access um, through that point. And just a quick. Sorry, I'll just add a supplementary to that, Councillor Braun. Um, you'll see condition six requires that they will have to put an active link onto West Park Road. Um, so there will be an active link proposed onto West, Star, West Park Road, just not a vehicular one. Um, but Condition 6 secures that. And if I may just have a supplementary on the traffic side, and that's that out of the way. Um, I'm going to follow up on what Councillor James was saying about the access on s &D Road onto the A93. That is a particularly difficult turn there. Um, even a, uh, an estate car, has to, if it's turning left, has to pull across the road to clear the corner. Um, and with the volume of traffic, I, I think I think I'm concerned about the the volume of traffic that could potentially go through. Um, there is an incline as well as you're coming to the junction, so it is a particularly difficult turn. Have we considered perhaps having some form of uh, traffic control on that junction? Mr. McLean. Thank you, convener, and thank you for the question. Um, you'll see um, on the portal um, we have drawing number 44, um, which is looking to improve um, the visibility on s and Road. Um, and we've also got um, condition number seven, um, which is for um, improvements there. Um, we haven't considered, um, or I'm not aware of, um, the signalisation of s and Road um, being considered. What we have considered is um, improvements um, to the geometry um, for people crossing that junction there. Um, and in relation to the previous question about the, the pedestrian crossing, um, if you look um, on the map that's on the screen there, um, you've got the junction into the right hand side and um, where the development um, for the private houses is going and you've got a parking court on the left. Just above that, um, you've got a, a path that links the two development sites. And my understanding was that um, that was the location of the, the, the signal um, pedestrian crossing um, that we're looking to install there. Thank you. Can I have a supplementary on that? Because I, I think the thing is, it's the volume of traffic potentially as this development comes through, because from the map, it looks like all the traffic is going to come out onto s Road. There's no access on West Park Road, which is fine, but it's a difficult turn. I'm just thinking as we go along, should we not be considering this now? Um, because the sheer weight of traffic is going to be coming out onto that main road. 
it's, it, the A93 is passable with two traffic, but each way, but it, it gets narrow at that point, which makes that a difficult junction to turn from. And I think um, we could be looking at uh, more, more positive uh, input there. Mr. Smith, you're taking that. Yeah, uh, maybe just uh, give you some confidence that we have kept very carefully considered uh, the access and ingress arrangements, not only associated to, to this phase, but the wider master planning of the site. Uh, and we feel that we have sufficient controls uh, and future opportunity to make sure that that is appropriate. Councillor James, you have two questions. Yeah, thanks, Convener. It's, 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 I can lump the two together, to be honest. It's um, uh, uh, and I'd just like to reiterate what uh, Councillor Braun has just said, and I totally agree with that. Uh, my my question refers to page 17 of our papers, Paris 69. Um, it says Scottish Water have advised there's currently insufficient capacity. So will this affect the start of the build? Uh, and if so, to what extent and what will happen if uh, Scottish Water don't make the connection. And the other thing, uh, which I, I, I suppose of it, consultees, um, when this came to um, in principle uh, uh, permission, um, I did query the NHS. You know, we're we're putting an awful lot of people into um, a, an area into Blairgarry, uh, and I, I live there myself and, and know well the problems. Um, can the local surgery? cope with the amount of housing planned um, and I see nothing in the papers about consultation with the NHS. Thank you. Thank you Councillor James. I'll take the first part of your question about Scottish Water and Mr Smith will take the second part about the NHS. Um, so with regards to Scottish Water I direct you to the consultation responses paragraph 32. Um, so Scottish Water well, were consulted, they have no objection and they have identified there's currently insufficient capacity. However, they have got plans, they've got a growth project plan for Blair Gowrie to provide the increased capacity and they are willing to work with the developer to um, agree a phased report approach to its delivery. So Scottish Water, whilst there isn't currently capacity today, they have got a plan to expand for Blair Gowrie and they will work with the developer to ensure that there's a phased approach. Um, so hopefully that answers your Scottish Water query and I'll pass to Mr Smith now about the NHS query. OK, thank you. And again, maybe just clarifying on the, the Scottish Water matter that obviously the developer will require to secure the connections uh, and that will be a matter between them and Scottish Water. So there will be the uh, control in that respect. Turning to the, the issue that you were raising in relation to the local surgery and things again, I think this was covered uh, when we spoke about this development at the planning permission and principle stage. Uh, the NHS and Health and Social Care Partnership were consulted at the point of local development plan two's preparation and raised no concerns over the ability of the, the, the surgeries or other services that are under their control to accommodate the future growth uh, and therefore you know, we are not in a position to question that and there's no, now no further opportunity to consult with them uh, going forward because this site has been allocated for the, the volume of, of development uh, for quite a number of years now. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Cuthbert. Thank you, Convener. Yeah, my uh, question relates to Policy 20, Affordable Housing. Uh, policy 20 says that wherever practical, the affordable housing should be integrated with and indistinguishable from market housing. But what we have here is the affordable housing in a completely separate section from the site, and not integrated. I wondered why. OK, I think you know that's perhaps an interpretation there. Uh, I would feel that the, the development is integrated in terms of its design layout. Uh, it's indistinguishable from the remaining parts of the proposal. Uh, it's blocked together because the operators and providers of those units, uh, that is their preference. They would like to have uh, all their assets in the one place to ensure that it's as viable uh, and manageable as possible. Uh, and we have no particular issue in relation to that. We would also look at it in the wider sense uh, that this is integrated to the Gowrie in itself. Uh, but I think you know, my position and my view would be that this is integrated into Blue Gowrie. Uh, it provides a range of house types uh, of similar design uh, and well considered in terms of their, 
uh, relationship and design parameters such that they're integrated. Councillor McPherson. Um, thank you, convener. It's just to uh, clarify that the path with the public right of way that was uh, um, illustrated in the in the presentation um, is just to clarify that that will be appropriately lit. Thank you. Yes, so um, the new section of the path will be appropriately lit. The existing section, there are no changes proposed to that, but the new section which will go through the development, because that will be subject of our RCC process, um, and because it's next to the road, there will be lighting on that path. Councillor Braun, you have two questions. Back again, I'm sorry. Um, two things. First of all, I'm looking at the, the plan, um, particularly the houses uh, in the affordable housing section. Um, there seems to be no parking adjacent to any of the properties. There seems to be in, in pooled, pooled parking, I think, was, as it says in the, in the paper. Have we any provision for electric vehicle charging? How's that going to be sorted? That's my first question, sorry. Thank you, Councillor Braun. Um, there is a change in the building regulations which comes into force later this year. Um, I believe it's July, um, but don't quote me on the exact date. But there is a change coming into the building regulations which will require electronic charging points for properties. So depending on when this is delivered, they will be required to do that anyway as part of the building warrant application. Um, but we do have a condition on anyway about the carbon reduction and things like that. So we can look at it as part of the conditions on this permission anyway. Yeah, and the other question is uh, relates to flooding. There's been various comments about flooding on this site. Um, and after phase one was built, there was some considerable flooding in the, the woodland behind it. Uh, well, I think that was solved what the problem was, but um, there's been various comments brought up about existing suds ponds that smell. Uh, I don't know what the problem is there, if that's just the, the, the time of year. Um, but it, is this a site that has, uh, well, are we concerned about flooding on this site? Because I think one of the comments is we're digging into the water table. Uh, and I think that needs to be clarified verbally, if we could, please. Thank you, Councillor Braun. Yes, whilst we don't have anyone from the flooding team here with us today, um, they were consulted as part of the application and raised no objection. We have added a condition about temporary surface water management during the construction phase, so that hopefully any construction related flooding is controlled. Um, and that condition is in force until the new studs are um, fully operational. Um, so the flooding team have been consulted, they've no objection, and we've added that condition about the flooding during the construction period until such time that the new suds are, are operational. And just a, maybe a supplementary to that, I think the issue of flooding has been raised on a number of occasions over a number of years and it's been investigated in detail by the structures and flooding team uh, and we're satisfied with the arrangements in place and are not concerned uh, in relation to the impacts that this development would have that would all be controlled appropriately uh, and equally the issues related to the, the lower lying areas in the forest. Is, it's, it's not considered that that is related to the development of the site in itself. Billy Williamson. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. My, my uh, question is about uh, condition four about the uh, archaeological survey. Um, does that uh, condition actually give a time limit on it? Because I also noticed in condition one, uh, the developers got two years to start uh, the project. So how long is the archaeological survey being given to uh, be done? Thank you, Councillor Williamson. Um, yes, for this one, so the way Condition 4 is worded is they cannot start any works on site until they've got the archaeological um, condition in order. So that does not supersede the overall time limit for the permission. So they need to comply with this permission before they can start work to then comply with the other condition about time implementation. Um, so Condition four, it has to be complied with before work start, basically. And that, like I say, that doesn't change the overall expiry date of the application. Yeah, maybe just to, to confirm that, what, what would be agreed is the programme. So prior to commencement of development, they would agree 
what was to happen in relation to the archaeological investigations. Now, that doesn't mean to say that all the archaeological investigations would need to have taken place prior to commencement of development. It may well be that there's a rolling programme uh, and it would also likely include uh, aspects such as if anything is unexpectedly discovered, what would then take place? Thank you. I see there are no further questions. My tablet seems to be running a bit slow at the moment, so I'll just confirm that. Yes, no, no further questions. Can I ask for a motion? Councillor Braun. Uh, thanks, uh, convener. Um, <clears throat> I've looked at this very carefully. Um, I think just for the record, so we clarify, uh, because this comment's been made uh, online, um, when this came forward for approval in principle, uh, I supported the application, uh, as did I think the whole committee at that time in that session. It was unanimous support for it. Uh, and when the application came forward for phase one, uh, I also uh, supported that, as was I think a unanimous decision uh, across the board. Uh, and it has proved, I think, it's, it, it will be good for Blegarry in due course. Uh, we're in a cost of living crisis at the moment, which is obviously affecting all businesses, West Park, in the town, um, whether big or small, even in the outer villages, we're all suffering at the moment with, with the cost of living crisis. Uh, but it has been a, 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 a good development. It has proved successful with the community council and the uh, Business Association. There have been good meetings between various parties uh, and they have been constructive and positive, but obviously COVID and the cost of living crisis has delayed things. There's more meetings to be done, I think, but it's uh, it's moving in the right direction. This is a move into the residential area now um, and it's, it is a big development. And as I say, we've, we've approved it in principle, but I have some concerns here. Um, and I think when we do it, we have to get it right as we got the first part right. Um, First of all, if I may, uh, there's a couple of points here which I'm, there are no policies for, and I, I think I, I can't argue them too much. But I note what Mr. Smith has been saying about the NHS. Um, but the comments were uh, that the inquiries were made some three years ago. Uh, Blegaria's situation is changing. Uh, I believe we only have two surgeries, GP surgeries operating. Uh, one, I believe, is has closed its doors to new patients or is almost at that point, unless you're a relative of an existing patient. The other one is still taking people on, I believe. Uh, the Cottage Hospital is closed as a turn up and have service uh, system. It's now a care and treatment centre. Uh, the existing GPs cover both Blair Gary and Rattray. Um, so I, I feel we need to make some inquiries there uh, in, prefer in preparation for future future ones, but that, that, that's a point I, I just think needs to be raised. Um, as to this particular development, my two concerns are, and one's been mentioned already, and that is the fact that affordable housing is all in one site again. Um, our policy is that it should be integrated. That is our policy, that's policy 20, uh, and it clearly says these should be integrated. Um, there's a development just across the road, which is <laughs> less than a mile away, it's just yards, 100 yards, 200 yards away. I don't understand why the two can't be interchanged. Some of the private housing put into the site to the left of Essendon Road and some of the affordable housing to the right. So I don't think we're complying with our own policy there. That's my concern. Uh, and the second one is that um, uh, we should be looking at it, it quite clearly says in policy 60BE that the infrastructure of electric vehicle charging should be in place and part of the plan when it starts. And I think we're infringing that policy too, Mr. Elliott. So I, my concerns are those two policies uh, that we're not um, complying with policy 20, which is the affordable housing being integrated across the site. And this is a big site and policy 60BE, which requires the infrastructure to be put in for electric vehicle charging uh, straight away. And the fact I appreciate what Mr. Panton said about July, but yeah, that's the future that we're, we're talking about today. So they are my two concerns, Mr. Elliot. Uh, I'm not sure whether they're competent or not. I think perhaps we should see if anybody seconds me first of all um, and go from there. Thank, thank you, Convener. Sorry. You are moving for refusal? On, the, on At the moment, yes. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, to make it clear. Make it pardon. Yes, sorry. Do we have a seconder? Councillor James, is that seconds and or? No, I was moving for, for um, uh, allowing the application to uh, convene. Right, thank, it seems to me that my colleague is refusing it. Oh, okay, thank you, Councillor James. Do we have a seconder? Seconder, Councillor Cuthbert. 
Thank you, Convener. Yes, I, I don't view this as being integrated with the affordable housing, so I would move refusal on that basis alone if the other condition uh, can't be, isn't legally binding. Thank you. Uh, can, do we have an amendment? Councillor James. Yeah, thanks, convener. Uh, I, I would actually go for, for um, granting permission uh, on, in this application. Whilst I take um, Councillor Braun's um, concerns, uh, and they, they are valid concerns, if I'm honest, uh, and this is a difficult one. Um, however, we're getting the affordable uh, housing at the beginning of a project. And bearing in mind, this is a bit, big project, uh, which could at any time um, stop. They could stop building, you know, if the cash runs out or, or the market dries up, but we will already have our affordable social housing. Uh, so to my mind, I see it as a bit of a bonus. Um, with regards to everything else, I think we've addressed all the concerns that, that I would have seen. Um, and this this area at the minute, it's just used by dog walkers a, a lot. Uh, it's an untidy, unkempt area. We, we'd already given it planning in principle, and I see no reason why we should uh, actually turn this down. So I, I would uh, go with Mr. Panton's recommendation. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor James. I see Bailey Williamson, your second, the second in the amendment. Yeah, I'm happy to second the amendment. Thank you. Is there any other amendments? No, none. None. Can I ask if members have any comments? No comments. OK, well, I'll hand over to uh, Colin for the legal advice. Thank you, Kimina. Uh, I want to address the terms of the motion to defuse. And if you bear with me, I'm catching up on the terms of the policy and what you've referred to. Um, but I think, first of all, you have referred to policy 20 affordable housing. Um, now, my comment would be um, the particular sentence I think you're referring to is wherever practical, the affordable housing should be integrated with and indistinguishable from market housing. Um, what I would say is that's a qualified phrase because it says where practical. And also, I um, appreciate you would have your own views as to whether it's integrated or not, but um, it's clearly capable of being looked at in the wide, as Mr Smith, I think it was, referred to. Um, so I would, uh, while I can't say it would be incompetent to put that forward, I would um, question as to whether it's going to survive an appeal, for example. Um, so that's for you to take into consideration. Uh, you've heard, of course, that um, um, I think you may know that a provision of affordable housing is quite a complex um, picture. And of course, the register of social landlords, for example, um, they have certain funding, they want it in certain and they want it together. And of course, that's another factor to take into account. Um, so I have some queries on that, if I put it that way. Um, now you also, and I will come to the terms should you wish to proceed with the motion, but you've also got policy 60. 60 B E. Yeah, just coming to it. I think 60B is about uh, significant travel generating uses. Now, if you bear with me, uh, new development proposals, uh, and they should e, uh, support the provision of infrastructure necessary to support positive changes in low and ultra low emission vehicle transport technologies, such as charging points for electric vehicles, hydrogen fuel and facilities, car clubs, including for residential development. What I would caution you on there is, um, this is now March by the time the decision notice is issued. Um, and then you're almost in there, virtually inevitably going to get into a situation. The time the building warrants go through, you're into a situation where you're beyond the time and therefore the building warrants will require um, the provision of electric charging. Uh, obviously, at the moment, there's uh, some 
I understand it's some conditional control uh, looking for that. Uh, but but it's, from what I understand, it's going to happen anyway, and you would have to take that into account as well. So I think you've got severe difficulty on that one. I put it that way. Um, so I'm turning, I haven't yet written down the full terms yet. Um, so I'm looking at both of you as to whether you wish to proceed. Um, so thank, thanks. I, I, I appreciate your comments on 60B, Elaine. We'll, we'll, we'll forget that one. Um, and I want to make clear, I've got no objection to the affordable housing. I think it's a, we, we do need it in Blair Gary. It's just my thoughts were just to get it right. That's all. And to try and integrate. But if you feel integrate is um, subjective, um, I, I would be happy to withdraw the, the, the motion if that's the case. If you feel it's too subjective to to stand. I say I'm I'm not against the affordable housing. I'm going to make that clear from day one. We do need it, but uh, I just think we should try and get it right. But if you feel we're we're into subjective ground, then I'm happy to to, to stand back. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Councillor Cuthbert. You. Yes, I've lost my mover. Um, I, I do feel that um, we are breaching policy 20 here, so I would like to keep the motion in place and become the mover if you like. I don't know if someone wants to second it. Uh, a part of the reason for integrating is to avoid sort of ghettoization, and there is the potential for creating, uh, I, I mean, I use the, the phrase fairly carefully, but you've got all the affordable housing in one block in one part of the, the development. I think it should be integrated with the other buildings and that's the, the, the sort of the meaning of the, the policy and that's why we've got it in place. Right, thank you Councillor Cuthbert. Uh, do we have a seconder for the, the, the new mover of the motion? So as, I brought, as I brought the subject up, I'll, I'll, I'll second it. We'll get, let's get to a vote on it and just see um, see how we go. I think I think yeah, we've switched around, but it's the same thing over and over again. Makes life makes life interesting. Well, I've therefore <coughs> haven't yet got to the full terms of the motion. Uh, sorry, uh, yes, it would still be. The, let's keep it as the motion. Um, so, so refuse on basis that application. Contrary to Perth and Kinross LDP 2 2019 policy 20 affordable housing on the basis that the proposal uh, does not integrate with and is distinguishable, we'll put it around a positive way, from the from market housing. Would that reflect your motion to refuse? It does, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll now hand over to the clerk for the vote. Sorry, I'm getting all confused here. Something I do wish to sum up, Councillor Cuthbert. I think we should just move the, mo the vote. Thank you. Sorry, members, just to be clear, and I'm going to come back as to what you're voting on, but my, own, my recollection is the motion to refuse is by Councillor Cuthbert, seconded by Councillor Braun, in terms of policy 20, <coughs> I'm going to be very careful and say I think the amendment uh, by Councillor James, I think it was signed by Councillor Williamson, yes. is that correct, yes. is to approve. Um, so motion refuse, amendment approve. Yes. Thank you. Members, when I call your name, if you could let me know if you're voting for the motion or the amendment. Councillor Anderson. Amendment. Councillor Braun. Motion. Councillor Cuthbert. Motion. Councillor Illingworth. Amendment. Councillor James. Amendment, yes. 
Councillor Leishman. Amendment. Councillor McPherson. Amendment. Councillor Massey. Amendment. Councillor McCall. Amendment. Bailey McLaren. Amendment. Councillor Reid. Amendment. Amendment. Councillor Stewart. Amendment. Bailey Williamson. Amendment. Thank you, everyone. I have two votes for the motion and 11 for the amendment, and therefore the amendment will carry. Thank you for that. That now means that planning permission is therefore granted subject to the conditions in the report of handling. Thank you. Right, we now move on to local applications and the first application is for the erection of 28 dwelling houses and garage revised design site north of Hall Road, Gilton. And to introduce the report is Mr Paul Williamson. Thank you. Thank you, convener, and good morning, councillors. The next item on the agenda today relates to amendments on the southern part of our consented residential development, which is partially developed on the eastern edge and within the settlement boundary of Gilton. Overall, the proposal seeks detailed planning permission for the erection of 28 dwelling houses on part of the site that presently benefits from planning permission for 19 dwellings. As such, it represents an increase of nine dwellings with no fundamental changes to the road layout, suds, or general landscaping. Next slide, please. This first slide shows the location of the site to the east of Giltown Park, with the canvas Michael Byrne to the south and School Road to the north. The northern part of the site is beyond that and shall connect through to Northfield Road in due course. Next slide, please. Next, we see the submitted site plan. The area in red relates to the plots of the subject of proposed change, with the blue land, other parts of the development under the applicant's control, and white plots they then completed or sold dwellings. Next slide, please. I will run through a few examples of the dwelling types that form part of the application. First, we see semi-detached bungalows, which reflect others used on site. These ones in particular would front westwards towards Gilton Park. Next slide, please. Next is an example of one of the two-storey detached dwellings. This is proposed towards the centre of the site, but has also been used towards the eastern edge. Next slide, please. In this instance, this is one of the detached bungalows, with this one also located on the east towards Gilton Park. We'll now move on to a series of photographs to give members a, a greater appreciation of the site. This first photo is taken from the southeast corner of Gilton Park, adjacent to Hall Road. It shows that the development is underway with a number of dwellings already erected, ranging from single to one and a half to two storeys in height. Next photo, please. We next see a view northwards from the site entrance from Hall Road, with one of the suds ponds in the foreground to the right and Giltown Park to the left. Next photo, please. This next photo shows the existing dwellings in greater detail, with a view northeast over the Suds Pond. Next photo, please. Here we see the view eastwards into the first phase of the development. This illustrates the range of dwelling types together with the chosen palette of materials. Next photo, please. Next photo is from within Giltown Park and shows the wider construction site beyond the football pitch and with the retained trees on the left and the view to rising topography beyond. Last photo, please. This last photo is a more northerly football pitch, again looking east towards the application site. The two-storey schoolhouse is notable on the left-hand side, together with the copses of retained trees out with the application site. Next slide, please. Thank you, convener. That now concludes my presentation and I will leave members with the proposed site plan for reference. Thank you, Mr Williamson. Uh, we do have deputations on this item, so I will now pass over to the vice convener for the deputation procedure. Thank you. Thank you, convener. 
Um, we've got three deputations. I'd like to first call on Councillor Welsh. While you make your way up, Councillor Welsh, uh, just to tell you that you have 10 minutes for your deputation and after nine minutes, I'll give you a prompt. So give you a minute to, to sum up. And I'll start the clock whenever you uh, uh, start talking. Um, first of all, thank you uh, for the opportunity to speak uh, here uh, as a councillor and actually also as a as a resident of, of Gilton. Um, first of all, I find it actually disappointing to be here because um, the community spent significant effort um, on this particular uh, site, um, um, working with the developer and the landowner to approve the plan, the detailed plan approved in two, 2011 which was for 64 properties on the east side of the recreation ground and the east side of the boundary between School Road and Northfield Road. We involved Catherine Lloyd from the biodiversity team. Um, we, we, um, we worked very closely and it was, it was recognised it would be a significant benefit to the community. Um, in the last 10 years, essentially, the number of properties in Gilton has effectively doubled. The village, once this development is finished, will, will, will double in size over a very short period of time. Um, what, what has happened over the piece is that from the situation where we had a, a community really signed on to and, and, and looking forward to development, we've now had a situation where effectively through multiple house type changes, through a, 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 a further development of a site that was identified in the original local development plan of having six bungalows, um, 41 um, affordable houses um, have been built at the same time as this overall development. Um, and again, we absolutely welcome as a community um, these affordable uh, properties. These were put through on a, on a two week uh, neighbour notification basis to six residents. And, and again, it was a time when people were on, on, on holiday. The, the, you know, we, we as a community feel things are being done to us rather than done uh, w with us. Um, in, in respect of the, 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 the community essentially feels let down uh, by the planning process and that's that's the message I'm given time and time again. It is interesting to note from the original application approved uh, 0801456 which Andy Baxter uh, which is referred to in the report in that first application um, Andy Baxter uh, makes note that it exceeded the amount of units indicated in the local development plan at that time. The report today here is, is you know, our, our council officers, um, you know, are, are very much under pressure uh, with with work and you know bringing uh, reports to committee. But you know, I'm I'm just disappointed, uh, to be honest, in a, in a number of um, areas that uh, the reports highlights. It looks at, for example, uh, section uh, twenty six, where um, it says there are a number of further planning permissions revising other house types across the wider development site. Um, in, in, in principle, most of those have actually been changes of house type to two storeys. Um, it, uh, it talks uh, about uh, section uh, 27. It's not quite clear here. Um, I'm referring, I think, to the 41 I mentioned, but that's actually in the northern area of the site where the affordable houses are. So I think there's been a bit of a, 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 an error in the document there. In section 44, um, it talks about um, the density of, of dwellings and an extra nine dwellings are proposed across the site. Um, it, it pretty well states, uh, while it's not considered unacceptable in principle, um, assessment must be undertaken as to whether this would result in a welcoming, pleasing uh, and pleasant environment. And then goes on to say, uh, and a place uh, to live in offered for future residents. I'm not quite sure what, what it means then and, and what time it would have in the local area, but I, I presume that's just a, a typo that's not been uh, picked up. 
Um, in terms of of, of uh, section 45, it talks about the roof areas and physical development actually decreasing. I, you know, I do find this hard to, hard to work out when ultimately there's nine additional uh, properties uh, being constructed. It then uh, goes on to talk about uh, massing on site. Um, I, I actually don't know, and I don't think many many residents of Gilton would actually know what massing I, I, I actually is. Massing apparently apparently is decreasing, um, but um, yeah, what, what, what does this term, what, what does it actually mean? Again, how can you have nine more properties uh, with smaller gardens uh, 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 reducing uh, massing? Um, in section um, in section um, 51, um, it talks about um, um, effectively uh, Gilton having a range of house types. You know, I, I don't know if most people will only know Gilton by driving through the, 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 the main street and, and, and the village. Gilton is, uh, you know, a, a community that has uh, generally uh, organically grown over the years. It has uh, predominantly uh, single storey uh, um, artisan cottages. There are some uh, one and a half storey properties, some early uh, uh, local authority housing, which is two storey. But, but literally there will be around about a dozen uh, two storey properties in the village as it was uh, prior to house building commencing. It was interesting to note that um, the, the first uh, AG Stevens development, which was completed um, about, I think, about six or seven years ago, um, uh, to my knowledge, had had very few uh, two storey houses and, 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 and residents were absolutely delighted uh, and existing community members were delighted with both the quality, the layout, the standard. And indeed, I spoke to one or two residents who, who would actually be happy for uh, uh, that development to be put forward for an award because of the layout and the consideration that's been given to integration into the into the village. Um, however, you know, essentially in 51, what it talks about is is uh, and making reference to to uh, how this new new planning application will change that and a belief that in actual fact the mix and nature of the housing uh, will not detract uh, from uh, Gilton itself. Um, it's disappointing. I, I did ask to if I could present some some photographs here today and some layouts, uh, and I was told I couldn't. I could only give a, a, a spoken deputation. Um, but I'd like, if possible, um, uh, when I come to the end of my talk, to ask uh, uh, the one of the photographs that was put up up earlier on showing the layout is actually put up again. In fact, I don't know if somebody could maybe try and do that just now. Is that possible to do? It's, yeah, it's the one showing essentially the current development uh, looking down the main street where uh, one of the residents here today stays. Now, it, 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 you'll see on the right hand side here, there are two story, two, two story houses. That wasn't part of the original application. But, but the community put in no objections to that because what you can see is, is exactly what's described in modern uh, uh, um, settlements of this type in a, in a, in a community, community village community. It's got a mix of properties and a mix of house types. And, and, and what, if what you see there that has been built, if what is, has been proposed to be built was like that, there wouldn't be no objections from the, from the community of Gilton. That is is absolutely what uh, we would we would we would like to see. Um, I think if we go on to section 60, this is where, where the community has some some concerns, especially around additional properties. Surface water, water flooding has now been a significant uh, problem in our community. The burn that runs alongside the community, which uh, our core path runs along, has never flooded in the 26 years I've been in the community. We now have had three separate flooding events um, and, 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 and ultimately one of which seriously undermined a community bridge which was constructed by the previous landowner of the site and has undermined the foundations. Um, I understand from some of uh, planning's uh, uh, documentation that that bridge should now be raised. Who's going to pay for that? Who's going to essentially continue to make it an all ability path? It will now have to have ramped access. It never, that, that burn never flooded before. In the, in the most serious flooding event, significant amounts of water affected the far property on the right hand side. Uh, the the neighbouring landowner, a farmer, has now taken, I understand, uh, and I think mitigating, mitigating measures. Why is the landowner doing this? Uh, has it been assessed by SEPA? 
Actually, I checked and it's just a pipe putting water, more water into this burn. Um, so, so we're in a climate crisis just now. There are nine additional uh, houses going to be built here. Um, the flight, the site uh, uh, that the contractor is working in has been flooded in multiple times. There is a walkway uh, akin to St Mark's Square in Venice uh, to access parts of the construction site. Um, machinery um, um, storage containers have all been affected on site because of flooding. The Suds facility, which is was essentially full with only the third of the site built, we're in a climate crisis here with wetter and warmer winters. How, how are these properties going to be heated? Currently, all these properties are, are heated by oil. We're going to have a further nine properties heated by oil. Are they uh, ready to receive heat pumps? H has suitable piping been put in with radiators uh, to allow the householders uh, to do this? OK, thank you very much. Absolutely, yes. Could I ask members if they have any questions for Councillor Welsh? Councillor Brown. Uh, thanks, Vice. Uh, thank you, Vice Convener. Um, thanks for the presentation, Councillor. Uh, interesting, and uh, as always, um, just trying to get to the bottom of what the problem is. Is it the number of houses that you're concerned about, or is it the uh, the layout of the houses. I mean, looking at that photograph there, the mixture, as you said, looks fine. I mean, is that that the? Isn't that not the idea of what what the next proposal is? I mean, a mixture of houses, or I mean, is it, is it the numbers or the the style that you're you're worrying about? Sorry, it's 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 to give this uh, uh, suitable environment. That's referenced in the in the in the planning report. That this is very much a, a you know something that is that a built environment is something that that ultimately you know there's a, a look and feel of, of a place, and the look and feel of Gilton, in a modern context, is exactly that. That is not what's proposed in the in the in in the in the in the, in the two thirds of the site that's still to be developed. It's principally to be two story houses. Um, those two storey houses you see on the right hand side essentially will form a, a wall down the east side of the of, of, of Gilton and and in the drawing that was part of the report the east side of Gilton which which sits in a bowl uh, essentially looking down on that now will act like a like a like a two storey uh, wall there is as part of the original um, application there was no Sometimes you see a, a, a 10 metre or a 6 metre buffer strip of trees and shrubbery to provide a soft edge to communities. That wasn't done, uh, unfortunately, at the time, which was, which was, a, you know, I think a mistake. Um, and, you know, there's been further things. Uh, yeah, I, I won't go into details, but, uh, but it's just if it was like this, the community would have no problems at all. Um, and, 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 and the community are, are happy with variations, but this is not what we're, we're, we're getting now. We're getting a predominantly uh, two-storey constructed uh, change to the development, which, uh, as I say, is just not in the look and the feel of the property. Um, thank you. Councillor Anderson. Thanks, Jack, for that presentation. Um, talking about the early days, you mentioned um, the local development plan for the areas for mainly single-storied houses has grown, as Gilton has grown up. I think you're one of the 10 or 11, it's got a two story property with an area. Um, you mentioned that something funny happened with the north end of the site, Clacken, ex Clacken site, that how much community input was to the design of the house, size of the houses in that area. I think it looks like it's almost um, four single stories and 38 or 39 two story properties have been built in the north end of the site, which doesn't seem to relate to the what Gilton's local development plan and this is a very similar situation being proposed for this one here, which is 22 two storeys and only six single storeys. What involvement did the community have in the first one part? Uh, thank you for the question. And, and again, there was huge amounts of effort and community consultation done by the landowner 
and and the, and 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 the developer um, when the original site here and the and the uh, the site at the end of the park was being developed. Clack and Construction owned uh, the section of ground uh, uh, essentially to the north end of the site, and and ultimately um, AG Stevens purchased that and the six uh, uh, bungalow outline planning permissions that had been uh, consented, uh, they essentially put forward uh, a, a detailed planning with a two week uh, neighbour notification process. I, I think you know, they did what they needed to do. Um, they they, they, they uh, got in touch with the immediate neighbours, uh, but ultimately um, the community were not involved at all, and, and those neighbours, mainly elderly, uh, some 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 widowed, um, you know, they're not they're not aware of the planning system. They don't know how it works. There was there was no opportunity, or there was limited opportunity for it to be uh, effectively, you know, properly d d discussed. And and I think ultimately, um, I, I, I'm an absolute uh, supporter of of affordable of affordable housing. But again, I, I think in hindsight, the the, the layout uh, could could have been done in a more sympathetic uh, in a more sympathetic basis. But taking into account the the need for more dense housing uh, to ensure we get uh, high quality uh, affordable housing constructed. But uh, taking your point, again, it's. Part of this aspect of, of of the community feeling as though things are being done to them, um, and ultimately, as a as a local councillor, I'm I'm motivating my local community to take active part in in the in the new local development plan. I I am getting feedback that what is the point? Why should we bother? When ultimately, um, you know, it does not seem to to uh, make a difference. Ultimately, when the community is allowed to 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 become involved. Ultimately, you know what happens. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Welsh. There appears to be no further questions. You can free to go. Now call on Mr. Penny. Mr. Penny. Uh, you have 10 minutes to make your deputation and I'll give you a prompt with a minute to go. So whenever you're ready, I'll start the clock. Uh, good morning and thank you for giving me the time to go on the floor and speak. Uh, and thanks very much for Mr Welsh's. Uh, I thought it was not. Oh, sorry. Um, yeah, and thanks Jack for your presentation there. Um, I would refer to the main objections that I put in initially, uh, which was made up of uh, two points. Uh, point one being to the site plan, which remains unchanged. And point two was a direct impact to what own property, which is seen on the screen here to the left hand side. Um, in fact, that's actually quite a good day that you're actually seeing it. Uh, I can refer back to what Jack was saying on the 22nd of November, which was a totally picture. It was sheer panic, um, carnage due to the flooding, which I'll get to a wee bit later. Um, however, I would just like to clear today, since John Stevens here uh, is regarding, uh, I had quite a few uh, consultations with, with Jack and John and regarding to point two, um, which in turn he did uh, come up with a, a plan in revising what he had put in uh, with bungalows to the west side to the park, plus the one that's adjacent to the back of our house, which he was going to be putting in uh, a bungalow. bungalow. So basically, um, we approved it in principle, and although we're waiting for a formal approval uh, in respect to the new revised site plan. Um, so that was that. Um, I would like to go into the main report for you, Andy Baxter. Um, it's under the background and description, uh, paragraph five. Um, I would like for you, I've, although I've had formal discussions with John, um, Stephen, regarding the 
the one with traffic system that's allegedly meant to be active now, although that doesn't seem to be the case. Uh, I have been told it's meant to be all traffic, site traffic going in from the north field and coming out and using Hall, Hall, uh, Hall Road. Now, Hall Road has actually shrunk in size and all the traffic that's been coming in, lorries, etc. You can't get two lorries through there. But however, by mounting the pavements, etc., they are getting through, uh, which is totally unacceptable. Plus, the actual fact that the the parameters of the the paving to the roads are all broken. So, I find it unacceptable. So, really, the point I'm making is is to find out today a formal verification that it is indeed going to be a one-way system coming in from Northfield and exiting the uh, Hall Road. Uh, moving on to site history, uh, I would refer to 25, 26, 27. I just wonder uh, how the PKC has allowed so many changes to initial site plan. Uh, as I was basically the first person to purchase a house and reside in uh, the site, um, it's been extraordinary to find out that basically it's went from 64 to 84, now going to 90. Now, it's fair to say nobody likes change, but I've bought many uh, a new property and I've never seen anything like the changes that are getting made just now. Now, it was very lucrative for me to buy a two, it wasn't taken lightly on the property that I bought, but it was based just like everyone else here. You base on what you buy because of what you see on the site plan. Um, so it's basically to find out when will this be exhausted or does it just keep on going? Um, moving on to consultations uh, 2930 for external and 34 for internal. Um, with <laughs> Just with what Andy's got down there, uh, I find it a bit questionable. I wouldn't mind finding out a wee bit more regarding where he's come for that, uh, especially to do with SEPA. Now, I'll get to that just at the, at the end here. I'm just about there anyway. Um, and draining and flooding. Moving on to design and layout 44 and 45, with reference to assessment to be undertaken. I would like that to be elaborated on that is because um, I'm just wondering how he's going to get to that. Is that prior? If you could just elaborate on what he means by assessment to be undertaken, i.e. is it going to look pleasant? Is it going to be look satisfactory or that? Uh, and once again, a roof space, less physical build, etc. I'm having a hard one working that out. Like I, I find it it's the same space, but you're condensing a lot more houses in and there's less space between the houses. So I have a, an issue with that. Moving on, draining and flood, flooding, 59, 60, 61, 62. Concerns uh, regarding the flooding of the canvas uh, burn. I will draw attention to November 22. Now, I sent uh, an email <coughs> um, on the 24th, I think it's the 24th, uh, Stevens, and I, I've had no reply, and that was in reference to what happened. I have got, I've got video footage which would totally change this. Uh, it was absolutely horrific. So, um, basically, what happened was the do the at the very bottom. Sorry, at the very bottom. Uh, there was a, a a client, a resident that stays at the bottom, and due to the the geography or the the landscaping of the farmland, uh, the excessive water that, that was in there, and the breach of the burn, um, basically flooded this property. And myself uh, and, and Stevens and some of the the, the other residents. Uh, we placed sandbags. Everybody was on 
you know, on point to try and get help this guy um, save his property. Uh, now I've got video footage to the back and that's facing to the south, which has got two, um, what do you call it, two fields, which once again, uh, the geograph, what, there's water coming from that side as well. Now, as it runs along the, the canvas, Michael had already burst its, it breached its um, sides and between the water and the field, this was a torn, right? Which brings me to the, the situation. All this road here, all these whole um, main, uh, main drains and that, I've never seen anything like it in my life. My house shuddered because of the pipe work, because the pump station couldn't handle it. Um, <clears throat> so there was a, it was all pushed back. So all the drains, and there's a drain to my left hand side that full, filled up with sewage, but my whole pipework system started shaking. I went out and I've never seen so many men running about no knowing how to deal with us. The suds filled up, these outsides were bubbling full of water. This was a torn all into here. Now, I spoke to the Glasgow firm that came up, they had to put the, um, switch the pumps off because of fear that they were going to be burnt out. So that's an area they pushed all the water back again. Our toilets filled up, I couldn't flush them or anything, and it was all sewage. So, okay, thank you. Oh, mate, sorry. So basically, uh, that is that. I wish I could show you the, the, the video footage because it would surely show you a different contrast in that. I'll touch on it lightly. There's a new core path that's been put in and it's it's in work in progress, if you want to put it that way. And it's um, basically, I feel that it's in the wrong position because it's right beside the burn. And just like uh, Councillor Welsh has said, Climatically, we live in a time where it's, there's going to be more and more rain, rainfalls we get it. And I have got every confidence that that burn is going to breach again and it will engulf the, the core path that's um, being built. Oh, fine, thank you. Are you willing to take questions from the members? Certainly. Members, do you have any questions for Mr. Penny. Bailey Williamson. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my question is about uh, you. You've identified as a flood risk and uh, paragraph 60 identifies that, that there was a, a flood last year. Um, <clears throat> And I believe that there are mitigation measures being investigated by a neighbouring landowner. Are you suggesting that these might be insufficient or? What I would like to point out is I, uh, like I says, I had emailed um, A&G Stevens. Uh, it was initially to a Bruce Strachan. Um, they asked them um, basically to give me a report on uh, the CEPA report and what the, the PKC were um, and what the long, long term approach uh, from the developer was going to be to stop or find out how they were going to control us for future. Because my concerns are is because where that is, is on communal ground and the with the, you know, with the flooding, etc., we eventually will have to take that over by our factor. And before the factor takes over, we want to make sure that that it is every step's been taken, that CEPA confirms that that did happen, and there's, you know, they are going to make, you know, basically take the steps to make ensure that this isn't going to happen again. Although the develop, uh, admittedly, the developers no responsible for the, the amount of rain. However, that is the nature of it. So it has to be deemed that there has to be stuff put in place to sort that. I was actually quite, as uh, Councillor Welsh had put over, and I spoke to various residents myself, and 
over the last 20 odd year, they've never known a flood. So we have to look at it and say, why? Why, why is this suddenly just a rose? Uh, I also like to put in that there is a, a, a bridge that um, that goes across the burn, which has been at some point installed by the Gildry. Uh, although there's no anything there that basically anybody's taken any responsibility for because that was gone. It was absolutely, during that time of the flood, it was completely gone. So, okay, thank you. Councillor Braun. Um, thanks for asking me and thank you for your presentation. I, I just want to clarify about house types, if I may. Um, most builders, when there's a big development, of course, they lay out their plans, as you know, uh, and they build and sell, build and sell. Um, but obviously, there's a change of market. Um, I just wonder, you, you, would you accept that, you know, as a builder, they have to adapt to their site to a different market? And it may well be that, you know, smaller properties, two story properties, may now be the demand rather than, I don't know if you're in a bungalow or, or what you didn't say, but um, on the left, yeah. So, I mean, as you're, <laughs> okay. But you would accept that market changes and they have to adapt because if they don't, they won't be able to sell. Would you agree with that? That that's the that's the that the driving force is the change in in, in in demand. What I would say is when on the site plan that I bought off of, um, I would say that what and I think Joint Jack pointed that out. If I, I actually have the the plan in my bag here, um, the one and a half story, and these ones here. The two stories going down there and the ones that were on the plan. Indeed, I think some of them were five bedroom. Right. Now, I was quite aware of that. I was quite accepting that. Um, and I was quite accepting the fact of what, the, the rest of the plan. So there was a, there was a mix. Uh, and especially to the, we, the, the west side of that. Um, so I already knew that. However, I believe that these, we had only moved in and these changes, right, I think, please don't ring me on this, but I think it was either July or August, I think these proposals were put in. So these have already been thought of prior and we, I never even knew about it basically until these proposals were put in. Now it's fair enough to say, um, when you get to my time of life, um, although it's personal, I went to go and choose the house and the plan where the, because of how you had the plan. I thought it was absolutely brilliant. I have to say that. And I'm in motion off for the progression or, uh, you know, for the rest of our site to get finished. I've also have to, and being quite honest, I've had to live with the, the part for quite a while knowing because it's something that I discussed with Angie Stephen regarding, you know, uh, this objection going in, whether it would be or would not be uh, accepted, and if it wasn't, he might not be able to finish the the, the site. So, in turn, uh, my my question was, if you're not going to finish the site, what happens to the rest of the site that we bought then? There was no reply to that. So, I've had to live with that for quite a while, uh, and also. Um, oh, sure. Sorry. Sure. Well, I think I'm, I think I'm asking that. I, uh, sorry, I, I think I'm covering that because, as you can see, in reference to times are changing, etc., and because of course, etc., it's not just the building side that that's got a knock-on effect. Every, everyone's got that. All I'm merely saying is, was John uh, through speaking to. Uh, him and through Councillor Welsh. Uh, obviously, John had recognised the impact it was making on that. So he did go away with it, and I'd like to thank him anyway, uh, you know, regarding his approach to it and what he put on the west side. Uh, to the park side, it looked fantastic um, and what he was putting it there. However, going forward, 
I've got no problem in respect to the, the, the two story. However, I still think there's possible room that you could look at to reducing that amount and put another maybe one and a half in. Uh, does that you happy with that? Councillor Anderson. Yes, thank you. One thing you mentioned in your statement to us with regards to one way system on site. My first call on this site was back in June last year after being elected and handed a notice, copy of a letter that had been sent out by John Stephen to put this one way system in coming in Northfield Road, exiting Hall Road. And that was going to start from the 15th of April last year. We're still no further forward with that at all. Um, and now this development is coming forward. That was really to ease the pressure of people living in Hall Road. I understood when I spoke to John about it. What we're doing now is we're. The question is, um, did you get that notice and you've seen the results of it? Uh, no, the only thing I've ever had is consultation with the developer. Um, I have spoken to, it's been an ongoing problem um, regarding the, the amount of traffic going in a one way system. And like I say, the two lorries and some of them are mounting up on the pavement. Uh, it, it, there's no there's no control over that. Uh, I had taken it up with the site manager, um, Grant, and uh, another chap as well. Um, but there seems to be the, the favourite, although it's not an excuse, the favourite one was is that they've all, all the, you know, other clients that they use for their lorries, etc. They've all been told, but it's the knock on effect. They believe that they, the drivers aren't getting told and that's why they're all coming. At the moment, there is something down at the bottom of the whole road saying there's no site construction tra traffic, but it still goes on. There's nothing being changed. And I have had cons uh, consulted John regarding that, and I have been assured, although it was verbal, I was assured that that it had all changed, and it, they were meant to be coming in Northfield and come, going out Hall Road. So it was all a one-way system. But I've had no formal letter saying regarding any change. Now we moved in, in, in on the May the 24th, I believe, uh, last year. So that's all I've had. Thank you. Councillor McCall. Thank you. Thank you, convener, and thank you for your deputation. My question really is about the flood risk that you mentioned. Um, when this event happened, um, were you given any assurances or what is your understanding of the infrastructure that's been put in place to manage potential future incidents of flooding. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, at the moment, I'll go back to what it says. I, I, I had sent a, an email in, a lengthy email, and uh, I'd actually passed it on to Councillor Welsh, uh, copied him in on it. Uh, up to date, I've had nothing. Uh, I have consulted John regarding that. Um, in fact, I had a meeting with him yesterday um, and I'd said that I was still waiting on that and I want I, I basically want it because I need to know um, that what is being done to prevent this in the future. Like, I, I really wish I could show you because I can guarantee, I can guarantee you, I've never seen such <laughs> carnage on a road and you know, it was just horrendous. And even for AG Stevens' workforce, to be panicking didn't they actually make the residents feel much better either, because they didn't seem to know what they were doing. Uh, although uh, myself and a neighbour, and I'm sure John will verify that, we went, uh, went along to help a neighbour to save his his house and it, basically a whole side of the a fence or a farmer's field had to be knocked away to allow this water to come out because it was coming from both sides. It was in the um, the field to the west, plus the, the, the actual burn had breached. So it was just a mass of water. Nobody knew what to do. And then 
course, allowing it to go into already breached water, this had to go somewhere. So the, the suds uh, basically took the, the fall of that, and it took a long time for the suds to, to move, if I can assure you. And uh, the, um, the actual uh, pump station, uh, that was quite alarming because the pump station could not handle uh, that volume of water. Like uh, they had to shut it off. Hence the reason there was backup of sewage. And uh, the 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 noise in our house was horrendous. And I, I checked with other neighbours; they were exactly the same. And if you went outside, the the collective uh, drain, if you want, uh, that had all filled up with sewage. Uh, and our toilets filled up, and we couldn't flush them. And then the guy came back, uh, there was a, a chap from Glasgow that I consulted because he was doing the motors. He switched the motors back on for a, just a short period, which alleviated the, the sewage to go down. But as soon as he shut them off again, it all came back up again. So it was quite, quite, quite frightening, uh, to, to be quite honest with you. My wife was quite frightened about it. Uh, Mr. Penny, there appears to be no further questions, so you're free to go. Can I call on Mr. Stephen? Mr. Stephen, as you make your way up, you'll probably be aware that you've got 10 minutes to speak, and I'll give you a prompt after nine minutes to sum up uh, in one minute. Sorry. Good morning. Uh, my name is John Stephen. I'm the Managing Director of NG Stephen. I'd like to start by thanking the convener for giving me the opportunity to address you this morning. Clearly, there's been one or two uh, points made uh, by Jack and uh, Graham, and I'll address those at the end, but I'll just go through my prepared comments and then pick up some of the points they made afterwards. <clears throat> we submitted this application in July last year, seeking to amend an existing consent dating from 2011. The application generated objections from 10 separate households. Nine of these were identical, and we understand were submitted by Jack on behalf of the, the residents. The focus of these nine identical objections was the inclusion of four two-storey properties adjacent to the joining park on the west side of the development. We reviewed these objections, and I also discussed them with Jack. Following these discussions, we amended our proposal to remove these two storey properties adjacent to the park and replace them with bungalows. We also place one other two storey house behind Mr Penny's house with a bungalow. As a result of these changes, 40% of the units on the amended layout became bungalows. This compares to 44% in the original consent. It's not the impression you would get from the presentations you've just heard. Following this amendment, most of the objections were subsequently withdrawn. Despite our efforts to address the objections, we understand that Jack then submitted a further eight letters on behalf of the other residents objecting to the revised proposals. These eight identical letters put forward a different set of objections, with the main thrust of the objection being the mix of house types within the proposal. It is these additional objections which have resulted in this application being considered by the committee today. In 2006-07, prior to submitting our original application for this site, we engaged with the community through a consultation process. At that time, the, the Guildtown Community Association commented in writing on various aspects of the development. In relation to house type mix, the response stated, and I quote, it was agreed that a range of house types was preferable. There was strong support for young families and also for four bedroom homes to offer larger accommodation options." Unquote. The contention of the most recent objection letter and Jack's presentation is that the proposed application does not conform to the feedback given during the community consultation exercise. This is not the case. The application before you if consented, 
would provide a development south of School Road, which consists of a mixture of bungalows, one and a half and two storey houses, i.e. a variety of family accommodation, as was requested by the Community Association in 2006-07. The percentage of each style are as set out in the committee report. Contrary to the impression you may have formed from Jack's comments a few moments ago, this is not a development of two storey homes. It is important to note that the response to the community consultation from the Community Association did not stipulate that the site had to be predominantly bungalows. Indeed, it never actually mentioned the word bungalows or single storey. It specifically requested a range of house types. This is the document here. This is what we've done. I know of no other recent housing site in the Perth area which will have a range of house types anywhere close to the number we are proposing. If consented, the private housing on this site will consist of 19 different house types. And just by way of comparison, recent application in Stanley by a developer, 10 house types, 61 private houses. That's a ratio of 1 to 6.1. Bridge of Ern, 10 house types, 83 houses. That's a ratio of 1 to 8.3. Milner Thort, 10 house types, over 51 houses. That's a ratio of 1 to 5.1. The ratio on this proposal is 1 to 2.6. So every 2.6 houses on average is a different house type. We have also provided 43 affordable houses in conjunction with Caledonia Housing Association adjacent to the private site. Once again, we have delivered a range of house types to meet the demand for family accommodation in Guildtown. The most recent objection letter also refers to the adverse impact on immediate neighbours. The only pre-existing house within 60 metres of any of the houses within this application, i.e. the only house that could be considered being an immediate neighbour, is the property on School Road called the School House. Within the proposed development, the closest new house, the School House, was originally consented as a one and a half storey house, and it remains the same in this application. It is therefore very misleading to suggest that this change of house type application will adversely affect immediate neighbours. It's also worth noting that it appears School House, which belongs to Jack, I think has three floors. In summary, we listened to the objections and amended the proposal to address these concerns. The proposal is to provide a range of family accommodation to fit all families, whatever their size. As confirmed in the committee report, the proposal conforms to all of the relevant planning policies. When the original planning application was submitted, the school role was at over 80% and there was a small village shop. The shop is now closed and there had been concerns within the village that the school could face closure as the role had dropped so much. The proposal being considered today will further help regenerate the community of Geltown by delivering homes for young families with children thereby helping to sustain the long-term viability of the school and the village. The last house on phase one is handed over to the customer next Friday. If this application is not approved, work on site effectively halts next Friday. I therefore respectfully request that you approve this application for the benefit of the residents within the development and the wider area, as this will enable us to continue with construction and complete the development in a timely fashion. <clears throat> I'm now going to try and pick up on some of the points that um, Jack and Liam Penny have made. With regard to the flooding, um, the flooding that took place is out with the applications before you today. No houses were flooded. There was some water in one, one garden. It came off the adjoining farmer's field. He has now undertaken and effectively whams a puddle filled up and backed up into the garden of the house in the back right corner. Farmer has now undertaken some works to adjust the levels so the water from the field now runs into the burn rather than into the garden. With regard to the foul water, Jack's correct, the foul pumping station was not working properly. The reason for that was the site was not finished and some of the surface water got into the unfinished sewers in the middle of the site. So the foul system was taking rainwater, surface water. If the site's developed, the rainwater will not be going into the foul sewer. So what Graham described did happen, 
but that was because it was an unfinished site, not because of a fundamental flaw with the system. Graham also mentioned that the suds took and they filled up. They're designed to fill up and they emptied quickly as was designed. So there's no problem there. With regard to his concerns over the footpath and the water from the burn going onto the footpath, that's actually designed to happen like that. SEPA required compensatory flood storage to ensure that properties downstream of the development within the village did not flood. So that the footpath is sitting on an area of ground adjacent to the burn that's been designed to allow in flood situations the water to come out of the burn and cover the footpath. That footpath pre-existed our involvement on the development, was put in by the Gildrey in conjunction with the community and to put the bridge in as well. There was no requirement on us to surface that footpath, but we have chosen to do so. So we've put an asphalt surface on it so that if the water does come over it, it doesn't impact on the long term maintenance of, the, of that footpath. Just bear with me a moment. I need a couple of notes. Um, yeah. OK, instead of in, in terms of the flooding as well, and as I say, the flooding that took place is not within this application. But even if it was. This application will reduce the amount of flooding. Or sorry, a runoff from the development because there's less hard standing area in this. If you've got bungalow, you've got twice as much roof, floor, same floor space as a two storey house. With a two storey house, you've got half the roof space for the same floor area. As a consequence of that, the hard standing area within development's actually dropped. The one way system is a voluntary one way system that we offered up to the community, and it wasn't clear from Jack or uh, Hugh's comments. It's a construction one way system. It's not a one way system once the development's finished. It would be two way at that point. We offered that up as a as a as a way to mitigate the impact of the development. Clearly on a construction site, it cannot be open all the time because there are deliveries, there's cranes, there's roads being surfaced, etc. So OK. Are you willing to take questions from members? Could I ask um, members if they could um, put in the chat if they'd like to ask questions? Councillor Leishman. Thanks very much, Vice Convener, and thank you for your deputation, Mr. Stephen, and also to Councillor Welsh and Mr. Penny also. Um, I'm curious as to what the thinking was in over providing affordable housing in some developments and then under providing um, or not at all even in this one. Thank you. It's actually one site it's deemed to be one site in the LDP. So we've over provided on the northern portion of the site. But the, the provision in the northern portion of part of the site is for this site. So and I can't remember the numbers exactly, but I think it was something like 23 or 24 additional affordable units we provided on the development. And just on that point in terms of the affordable, the, there have been some criticism of us by increasing the numbers within the development. The vast majority of that increase was on the affordable part of the site. There's only nine additional private units. So the, the significant increase in, in numbers has come from the affordable site and the mix on that site was dictated by Caledonia Housing Association. They, they, we actually removed bungalows from the northern part of the site to put two storey houses in at their request. Councillor James. Thanks, Vice Convener, and thanks for uh, your interesting deputation, Mr. Stephen. Very good. Um, my question is, is uh, regarding the flooding, which, which seems to be uh, a, a sort of a, a reasonably new issue. Um, you're relying on the, the adjacent landowner in, in carrying out some works uh, in order to stop the flooding coming over, but is there anything you can do to mitigate uh, flooding if that work isn't carried out satisfactorily at all, please. The, the, well, I'll just restate the flooding that took place is not part of this application. But to answer your question, yes, because the landowner in question is the landowner is the same landowner that we're building this site or we're buying the site from. It's the same landowner. Tenant farmer, but same landowner.
Councillor Braun, I see you've got three questions. I'm going to take your first question and I'll come back to you for your subsequent ones. Thanks, Vice Convener, and thank you, Mr. Stephen, again to see you. Um, Councillor James just touched on it really, my first question, but it was just um, about the flooding side of things. And I was just going to ask you, um, uh, from what you were saying, it sounds like the, the obviously the farm side was, was one problem, but the work in progress was another fact on your side. Uh, that obviously will ease as, as work is done. So that, that, that's a simple answer to that question, I suppose, and this one, he's, he's asked most of it, thank you. Yeah. Councillor McCall. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Vice Convener, and thank you, Mr. Stephen, for your deputation. I, I think my previous questions have more or less combined to ask my question, so I'll withdraw. Councillor Vron. I'll back in. Uh, second question was um, you mentioned um, the sale of the last property next week, I think you said, and if that goes and we don't approve, everything comes to a stop. But my question was that the there is an application, a planning application already approved for further building. Why can't that go ahead? If you, why would you want to come to a complete stop if we don't approve today? Thank you. There's various reasons for that, um, one of which relates to the viability of the project. Um, the committee will be aware that there were significant cost increases over the last 18 months in construction, and that's fundamentally altered the viability of many projects, not, not just this one. The other issue is that we as an industry, the construction industry, the house building industry in Scotland have been encouraged by the government to move to modern, modern methods of construction. A modern method of construction is whereby we construct more of the property, more of the home in a factory in advance of bringing it to the site. And as a company, we've invested heavily in that and we have a factory here in Perth where we manufacture closed panel kits. Now, that closed panel system encourages us to build either a bungalow or a two storey house. Storey and a half houses, which did form part of the original application, don't lend themselves to that process. So if you like, we are trying to react to the guidance and push by the Scottish Government by moving to closed panel construction, modern methods of construction. And I'll extend an open invitation to any member of the committee that wants to come and inspect our factory, have a look at it and understand what we're doing by investing in Perth and employing people here. So that method of construction is another reason for changing the house types in that second phase of the development. But there's still 40 percent no, bungalows um, on the development. There were 44. Another thing is those three developments that I quoted in terms of the ratio of house types, none of those developers had any bungalows. We've got 40 percent. The one way system, which was meant to come into operation on the 15th of April last year, it's not in operation yet. And yet you're still the reason for that one way system was to protect Hall Road from major traffic going up and down it. This development proposed now is wholly to be accessed from Hall Road. I presume that's what states from the application. Um, I'm not sure why is a change of plan. You know, various things on that point. The one way system is in operation, has been for some time. What Graham Penny is referring to is that on occasion, because there's a crane on the site or there's roads being surfaced, you cannot physically access from Northfield to the lorries have to come through. But there are signs up at both the northern end of the development and the southern end of the development explaining the one way system. And again, this is a voluntary system. It's not something we're required to do. It's something we've offered up to community to minimise traffic on both Hall Road and indeed Northfield. Now, as far as the development post completion, the road, which if you can see disappearing off the north north end of the, the plan there, will go right through to Northfield. So any house in the development could choose to exit to the north or to the south once the development is completed. At the moment, the blue houses, if you like, and the white ones within the blue, they all, they can only access off Hall Road at the moment, access and exit the site from Hall Road. 
because the red part of the site is on the construction. In fact, the roads aren't even constructed yet. Well, not totally constructed. There's a the central portion. We only got the RCC, I think, on Monday for that part of the road, the top part. Yeah. Thank you. Bailey Williamson. Thank you very much, Vice Convener. I was just wondering about the SUD scheme. The, the SUD scheme, has it actually been uh, adopted yet by Scottish Water? I would love for that to be the case. Um, Scottish Water tend not to adopt SUD schemes. In fact, I think you'll find of the tens of thousands of SUD schemes in Scotland, they've only adopted a handful at the moment. It's actually a national embarrassment, but I could fill a whole afternoon talking about that. Um, they, they are trying to improve that, and it should be adopted once the development's completed. The problem is they've not been adopting them. There's been a failure in their systems, but they're correcting that. Is it okay to come back in? I, I, I take it, therefore, it is a, of an adop, adoptable standard as it sits? Yes, it's designed uh, and approved both by SEPA and the Perth Economics Council's flood team. Councillor Brown. Last, last time. Um, come back to what uh, Councillor Welch mentioned about um, off our heating, uh, air source heat pumps. I just wonder, is there any reason why you didn't adopt them apart from the fact they are expensive? Uh, and I noticed there was a solar panel on one of the houses. Do you fit solar panels as a standard or is that just somebody who's opted to have that themselves? Can I hear you? will be solar panels on all the properties. Um, as far as the uh, air source heat pump goes, the difficulty is that in the grid within the Giltown area cannot support electric heating. Mr. Stephen, there appears to be no further questions, so you're free to go. And I'll hand you back to the convener. Uh, thank you, Vice Convener, and thank you to all the deputations. Uh, can I ask uh, members if they have any questions for officers? I'll start it off. Uh, I'll ask a question. Uh, during Mr. Penny's deputation, he happened to mention design and layout and density and point 44. Uh, can I get a little bit of a better understanding of what that actually means, please? Thank you, convener. Uh, yes, obviously, as part of the, the consideration against the relevant policies of the, the development plan, we have our own placemaking policies together with our supplementary guidance as well. Uh, we look to ensure that uh, every development that we consider and are looking to approve provides the correct level uh, of you know, open space, density of development, so that relationship of built form to garden ground, for example, uh, is appropriate. We've gone through that uh, with this application, as we do, as I say, with, with all applications. While we are seeing an increase of nine units overall, uh, increasing the number in the, the southern portion from 41 up to 50, as has been alluded to within the report uh, and also Mr Stevens' deputation, um, the roof areas of the, the development, as would be approved, um, have actually been reduced. And that's gone from 4,897 uh, square metres uh, down to 4,769. So it's 128 square metres or there about less roof area uh, as part of the development. Um, but fundamentally, um, we are happy and satisfied with the level of development that's proposed. The open space, etc., remains largely the same uh, as was approved through previous applications. And the site does have obviously excellent linkages to Guildtown Park, uh, just adjacent to the site as well. Thank you. Bailey Williamson, did you have a question? Yes, I do, Convener. Uh, I was just thinking about clarity from officers. It was mentioned during uh, Council Welsh's de deputations about the, the type of heating. Uh, and I was wondering if, if that's a material consideration and would that be covered, if so, under point uh, paragraph 68 and condition 7? Thanks, Bailey Williamson. Um, it is taken into account insofar as uh, we obviously have policy requirements to look at reducing uh, carbon uh, emissions and the uh, development. So we do have condition seven, which looks at the 10% reduction. Obviously, Mr. Stevens highlighted that solar panels would likely be used, but obviously the 
the exact details of it have to be submitted to uh, and agreed in writing by ourselves. But parallel to that is obviously the building warrant process and they have their own standards to, to meet through that. Uh, so we don't necessarily get into the specifics of, uh, you know, the exact type of heating, but we do look at the other technologies uh, to be taken on board. Just as a supplemental to that, you know, I understand what you're saying, and as I think we'll be aware that there are changes are coming in terms of the types of fuels, etc., that would be appropriate in built standards and in relation to building regulations at the minute. But in terms of the standards that we're looking at, you know, we're not able to say you're not allowed to use oil uh, because that's perfectly acceptable in terms of building regulations, etc. But in terms of the the condition in itself, it will require to recognise how carbon footprint, etc., is impacted upon and provide a 10% reduction in overall uh, carbon uptake and would be the standard applicable in terms of building regulations. It is a complex thing and a, a multitude of factors being taken into account. So if you're using oil, then you would need to look at how you, you compensate for that. Okay. Councillor Anderson. It's a more general comment. I'm after asking with regards to local development plans, um, what we have coming forward has been this, this last while is local development plans being totally ignored by the planners as such, because in most applications there's usually about 20, 30, 40 percent over what's been set in the local development plans coming forward to us to where developers have increased the development on that site and more often than not, the planners are recommending approval. What faith are we, you know, Community Council busy looking at local development plans three now. We're having consultations and that's starting in, was it, 2027, they're going to start into play. Um, if we're thinking of putting figures in to these plans, what faith have we got that they're going to be adhered to for the future? I'd just like to clarify that there, there are no numbers associated to the site in the local development plan, so there is no breach as you seem to be indicating. I, I'm, I'm not sure if I'm understanding your question correctly, but uh, I'm, I'm not understanding where you're coming from because there are no difference between the numbers identified against the site, which does not exist, uh, as opposed to what is proposed now. It may be that you're referring back a number of local plans uh, where the the, the situation has subsequently been reviewed a number of times, uh, so I, I don't accept the point that you're making unless I'm getting you wrong. Wrong, but I thought this was 64 way back in whatever century it was proposed. We're now, now coming up to 93 today in total for that development site. That's what's proposed. It's an extra of nine on what before. Is that correct? Is what you're saying that the numbers have changed as development proposals have come forward and those have been considered uh, and the impacts assessed and planning permissions granted. But there's no breach of <laughs> I mean, the local development plans have not been ignored. That is not the case uh, and unless I'm misunderstanding you. Thank you to argue that point, but just to say that um, it looks very much like they have been ignored, the changes that keep coming forward to us. You're, yeah, you're starting to make a comment, Councillor Anderson. Um, which, if I can come in there, that it is, as members will be familiar with, it is not uncommon for the original application um, after it's granted for there to be subsequent applications. And yes, you may see an increase in numbers. And you've heard some reasoning today as to why, but that is allowed in the planning system. Um, you know, further applications are allowed. It's for you to assess today this particular application. But we're not on LDP numbers. You know, as I've heard, there isn't a number currently on that. OK, thank you for that clarification. Uh, I see no further questions. Can I ask for a motion? Councillor Braun. Uh, thanks, Convener. Yes, I, I, I'm going to move the paper as is, if I may. Um, 
in any uh, development, there is likely to be a change in styles, change in property styles because of market conditions, market changes. And as we've heard, in this case, there's also a change in how buildings are constructed and how they need to be constructed in the future. And that future construction will obviously improve um, their insulation for heat and make them warmer and therefore less fuel to be used. So they have a knock on benefit for, for the mitigation of climate change. So um, I'm happy to move the paper as is. Uh, I know the comments made. I appreciate there has been some funny issues. Uh, as we've heard, that's not all down to the site. And obviously it's um, there's work in, work, ongoing work on the site as well, which can con contribute to it. And uh, the foul water drainage system failed because of water getting in because it wasn't finished. Um, but as I say, happy to move the paper as is. Thank you, Commander. Thank you. Councillor Illingworth, your second in motion. Uh, thank you, Convener. I'm happy to second the motion. Thank you. Do we have an amendment? No amendment. Oh, oh sorry, it's not, it's not come up. Oh, you've got questions, though. I move an amendment, please. Um, as I say, in conjunction with, as I say, what even local councillors' feelings is that um, the number increase is excessive. Um, it should be restricted to the numbers allowed for, and also the proportion of the build. Probably the best thing would be to reject the application as such. Um, to re almost to reverse what they're coming forward from instead of 22 for two story properties to six single stories that you revert to what's the normal building in that area the portion to restrict it to four, six two storied and four single stories which would be more appropriate to that development thank you Do we have a seconder for the amendment? No seconder, so the amendment falls. So the motion to approve is uh, one, uh, so planning permission is therefore granted as subject to the conditions in the report of handling. Thank you. Now, I'm going to ask members if they wish to have a comfort break just now. Yes, yes. So we'll have uh, 10 minutes. Come, come back at quarter two. OK, thank you.
OK, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Councillor Reid, are you there? I'm here, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Reid. Uh, right, so we move on. We're moving on to the next one is change of use from residential flat to short term let unit flat one Merlin House, Perth Road, Burnham. And to introduce the report is Mr Williamson. Thank you very much, convener. Next today, we consider an application for the creation of a short term let within a small development of six flats off Perth Road, Burnham. The application property is the upper flat in a two storey new build located at the rear of the wider site, which was previously occupied by a commercial garage. The site was only relatively recently completed and the property benefits from a single car parking space. Next slide, please. This first slide shows the aerial view of this part of Burnham with the application site outlined in red, which was formerly a garage located to the north of the wider site. In respect of surrounding land uses, it's predominantly residential, although another garage remains to the west. Next slide, please. Next, we see the site layout plan with Kestrel House and Osprey House located to the Perth Road frontage and Merlin House to the rear. The vehicular access leads to the centrally placed parking and turning area, comprising a total of eight car parking spaces between the six flatted properties. Next slide, please. This slide shows the floor plans for Merlin House, which would remain unchanged as part of the proposals. Access to flat one, which is on the first floor, is taken from the frontage via a secure lobby and a flight of stairs, which serves only that property. Flat two, which is on the ground floor, has access via a separate door to the side. The plans show that this is a two bedroom property with a lounge and separate bedroom window to the south, a further bedroom window to the eastern gable, and to the north facing elevation is a kitchen dining window and bathroom. Next slide, please. Now we see the elevations of this flatted block with a reminder that this application relates to the first floor flat. We now move on to a series of photographs to give a feel for the application property. Next slide, please. This slide uh, shows the dedicated access into flat one together with a separate photo showing the dedicated car parking space for the property and the path which leads to the property's external drying green and garden. Thank you, convener. That now concludes my presentation and I'll leave members with the proposed site plan for reference. Thank you, Mr Williamson. Do we have any questions for officers? <clears throat> Councillor Leishman. Thank you, convener. Um, yes, I'm just curious. Um, do we have any information and numbers in regard of how many short term lets we currently have in Dunkeld and surrounding areas of Highland Persia? Thank you. Uh, thank you for your question, Councillor Leishman. In short, no, we don't have the specific numbers associated with that. Obviously, the, the licensing requirements for short term lets only commenced last October and the period for obtaining licences, etc. Uh, is still ongoing. Obviously, we are still facing a number of planning applications coming forward as well. So we don't have an exact figure on that, no. Councillor James. Thanks, Convener. Um, my question, um, I, it's um, very difficult for you to answer, to be honest, uh, but uh, quite. Th this is unusual in the fact that we, we've already given uh, permission for it as a residential property, uh, and so we're, we're a change of use. Um, the, the title deeds, I'm led to believe, aren't a planning issue. However, they do. Uh, restrict its use. Uh, should that not be taken into consideration, though, when we do uh, make decisions like this on a change of use? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor James. Um, in short, as it's a separate civil matter, legal process, no, we don't take that into account uh, in the process. It would be a matter for the applicant to resolve thereafter. Thank you. Uh, I see no further questions on this item. Uh, can I ask? Uh, oh. 
Bailey McLaren. Hey, thank you. Sorry, sorry about that. Um, and I fear I maybe know this answer, but to ask the officers, uh, it, it was any evidence? Do we have any evidence that the applicant has made a, made any attempts to let the property um, in a short assured tenancy as opposed to applying to make this a holiday let? Thank you, Billy McLaren. Um, no, we don't have evidence uh, of that sort. Obviously, we've got a duty to assess the planning application as it's tabled before us. In this instance, the applicant has provided a supporting statement which has outlined the manner in which they would seek to rent out the property uh, going forward, uh, whether that be for minimum three night stays, how they would uh, deal with stays in peak seasons, looking at minimum of seven nights, etc. Um, but obviously, they've got the separate licensing process to go through as well. And maybe just uh, as a supplemental, uh, Bailey McLaren, that wouldn't have any planning implications if you know if it was a an owner occupied short term uh, rental, long term assured tenancy, etc. It's it's all falls under the same use class, so we wouldn't require or have any locus to ask for information in relating to that. Thank you, Councillor McCall. Thank you very much. Um, my well, I have two questions, if I may. The first question is on paragraph 31 um, about the. Uh, sorry, my apologies. Uh, section 3031 about the intentions of the owners as to the use of that in terms of the minimum length of stay, etc. How would that be enforced? And is that actually a condition of the planning application? <coughs> Thank you much for your, your query. Um, we don't have a, an intended condition uh, in respect of that. What we are considering is ultimately the, the use as a short term let. We are considering how the application differs, uh, if at all, uh, in relation to the residential use of the property as it was constructed and, and built. Uh, in this instance, we consider that general footfall, etc., associated with a short term let, the fact that it's a two bedroom property is unlikely to differ significantly. And as such, it wouldn't have any detriment on residential amenity from our perspective. And again, as an answer to, to Bailey McLaren, the licensing requirements associated with short term lets uh, are maybe a bit more stringent in respect of, of what their expectation is and for ongoing monitoring and enforcement of activities associated with it, as opposed to using conditions via the planning system. Yeah, maybe just as a supplemental again, I think that the questions you're asking are maybe matters for the licensing. Uh, of the property as a short term let uh, and rather than a, a planning overlap. So the planning system tries to avoid overlapping with other legislative controls. So we wouldn't seek to apply controls that were already going to be dealt with through a licensing process. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. Actually, it's just it was in the report, so I thought I'd address it. My second question, if I may, is in uh, paragraph 31. I'm intrigued to understand how you get to the conclusion and what measures you use uh, to um, come to the conclusion that the footfall um, would be different or the use would be different from a holiday let to a normal residential let, because frankly, in my experience, it's not the case. So I'm really interested to know how you've come to that conclusion. Again, you know, the law of averages uh, and general use. This is a two bedroom property can accommodate on average a particular number of people, which on average would equate with the particular number of people that could be accommodated in the property if it was used for uh, residential purposes, whether that be short term assured tenancy uh, or owner occupied. So again, it's looking at what would be the likely average use of a property which wouldn't necessarily differ from it may well be that there are peaks and troughs in relation to either use so you could have a residential property that has more people using the number of bedrooms that are in a property or less people using the number of bedrooms in a property and the same with a short term assured tenancy or short term let. Bailey Williamson. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, can Convener, uh, my page has just gone down on the on the uh, 
computer. Uh, essentially, uh, what I was trying to go, going to try and ask was a, a, a rewording of uh, Council Leishman's question about. Uh, I think there's a general concern about the density of short-term lets within the Burnham and Dunkeld area, and um, do we have any actually any data or regarding the density possibly from TASA Valuation Board on the number of properties that are actually claiming uh, business rates relief? Oh, sorry. Thank you, Bailey Williamson, uh, and for uh, letting me speak, uh, getting my button pressed. Uh, it's a complex picture, uh, and I think as, as many members will be aware, there is a, an ongoing process of investigating that issue, drawing together the, the actual numbers from a, a number of sources uh, is complex, uh, and I think that will be reported in due course uh, to members uh, on the potential uh, perhaps for short term let control areas if that is, is deemed to be appropriate. Uh, but at this point in time, uh, it is an ongoing process. It is complex to come up with, with the information with any degree of certainty at the point we're at at the minute. So we wouldn't like to give you any indication as to what numbers may or may not be. So we don't have a short term uh, let control area in place. That's still got quite a, a distance to go through the process. So we'll need to consider this application on its merits. Mr Elliott. Thank you. Just to add to that, yes. What you're looking at at the moment is a change of use from residential flat short term let this individual one. You're looking at the application and what you're, you're doing is looking at what would the changes be and whether those changes are acceptable. Uh, Mr Smith is quite in the good point to emphasise there is no short term let control area for this area. There may be in the future and that can be assessed, but that's up at the policy level that eventually would have to be approved by the Scottish Government. I'm aware there's two areas in Scotland I think at the moment that do have control, control areas, but in respect of this particular application, that isn't before you, there isn't a control area. So in terms of looking at the overall numbers in the area, that's more appropriate to the, the control area aspect, the policy issue aspect. What you're looking at today is this individual flat moving to a short term length and the implications of that. Yes, thank you. I, I, th I think my, my question is about the, the uh, suburbanisation, you know, the, because we have no real data around about the, the density of uh, short term lets. But we are aware there are a great number in, in, in potentially uh, hotspots such as Dunkeld and Burnham and possibly Pitt Lockery. But it's within that density that it is. Does it is it creating a suburbanisation of local people who are having to move out because they can't afford the rent? And, and is that a consideration we can take into? Yeah, I think I would just refer back to my previous answer and saying, well, that's unclear at this point in time and is being investigated as, as you're aware uh, and the outcome of that will perhaps lead to points in time where we will have sufficient information, data and policy positions uh, to consider when we're looking at applications like this. But at this point in time, we don't know whether what you're saying is, is correct or not. Thank you. Councillor Brown, you have two questions. Uh, thanks, Graham. No, I've only got one there because somebody's asked well, the other question touched on it. Uh, it was about parking. I was going to ask. Um, one of the objectors online mentioned that there's limited parking space there, and if you get several people staying at the Airbnb, they're going to use up some of that parking space. Uh, have, we, have we any concerns about that? We've not mentioned it as such, but there could be more people staying at this property than actually would reside there on a long-term basis. Thank you, Councillor Brown. Um, no, we don't have any concern in respect of the, the level of car parking. Obviously, it is compared to the existing use of residential property. It is two bedroom. Um, you know, there are eight spaces overall for the, the six flats there. We've had no objection from our colleagues in transportation uh, at this time. Councillor McCall, you've got a second question. I do really. It's just really to come back to my to my first question. Um, what I really wanted to know was how do you assess the difference in footfall, and I don't think you just said it's your consideration, but is there any, what evidence have you looked at from other short term lets and the impact on, on footfall in use elsewhere to come to that judgment? Please, thank you. Yeah, I think the, maybe to explain further, there is a range of 
numbers of people that could be accommodated within any building, whether that is for residential use or short term let use. Uh, and it could be that if it was a residential property, one person lived in the property. It could be that if it's a short term let, one person was occupying the property. It may well be that if there were uh, two people in each room, whether it be residential or short term let, then there would be four. There is a range. It depends on the particular circumstance of the individual situation and taking the average of those two, they equate to be the same. Thank you. Can I ask further clarification, please? Yes. Thank you. So in the report, it said that the proposal will not have a significant impact on the amenity of the existing residents. It would retain the residential nature of the property. But that isn't actually the case because the behaviours of short term let um, uh, visitors very often have different timescales. There's different use of when they arrive and depart. Um, and the, it's not necessarily the same living pattern as a residential, uh, normal residential use. Um, and I'm just wondering what, if anything, has been taken into account in that respect. So, for example, because um, you're looking a bit confused by my question, so maybe I'm not making myself very clear. So, for example, very often people who use short term lets arrive late or early. They sometimes stay up much later uh, than uh, others. They um, may, in fact, create noise at different times. Um, they may not be familiar with, with some local um, issues around uh, waste and refuse, for example. So there's a number of issues where, where people staying in short term lets behave quite differently from people staying in a residential property. And, and I'm just wondering what consideration you've given to that type of, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with what they do. If you're on holiday, you, you, have, you stay up late at night sometimes, or you arrive late or you leave early, but that is all different from the normal residential use behaviour. And so therefore I'm wondering what consideration you've given to that when coming to your conclusion in this particular paragraph. Thank you. Yes, again, looking at the, the property type, the arrangements of the property, the individual door, uh, the number of bedrooms, the arrangements for waste, et cetera, et cetera. Whilst I'm wholly appreciating that whether it's a residential property or a short term let, that there could be behaviours of individuals which might differ from the norm. On average, we're comfortable that the arrangements would be not so significantly different as to result in an unacceptable situation on average. Thank you. Uh, Councillor McCall, I kind of try and assist as well that remember you've got the short term let licensing um, regime. And if you're concerned about any social behaviour, then of course there's a fit and proper personal test when it comes into that. And that's more appropriate for that regime. Uh, what you're looking at is this individual property and the change from residential to short term let and in general what that can be, because of course um, you're, you're, I understand where you're coming from with potential changes, but equally you could have a resident that is in and out uh, all the time, etc. So it's looking at the general position here, but in terms of the impact of things, in terms of the amenity, I think that's a bit more on the short term late licensing regime. Thank you for that. Uh, I see no further questions. Uh, can I ask for a motion? Oh, sorry. Sorry, Bill. You, you will be sorry. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> um, yeah, my question is is essentially we, we grant, if we grant the planning permission today, then then that's it, isn't it? But I was just wondering how how easy or, or difficult is it to revoke a pre existing planning application? Is that is that something that can be done or is that something that has to be done? Uh, because of a breach of planning and uh, legislation. Concentrating on the planning side, first of all, the revocation of a planning permission is quite a very rare thing for very, very particular circumstances. And one of the reasons for that is the planning authority has to pay compensation, potentially. So there be, could be a claim of compensation. But I think you have to remember that is the short term. If there are issues on amenity, that's more the short term let regime. And of course, if they apply for and get a short term let uh, license, they're still subject to review on that system. And that's where they may have a, uh, if there are, if they lose a short term let license, of course, they then have a difficulty running that place as a short term let. So you actually have two regimes operating here. Yeah. So, 
so essentially it, it feels very much like it, it, it's um, from some of the questions that's been already done, it feels like that that it's down to the licensing committee through through the short term lets licensing policy to manage the short term lets until and we as, as such times as we actually get control zones put in if that's that's the way we're going to go. of giving you absolutes, but what you're looking at in terms of the you're looking at the planning use, you're looking at the change of use to a short term late and looking what the difference would be for residential. Now, after that's granted, I would tend to agree with you. I'm not going to be absolute in it, but tend to agree with you, of course. Again, come back to your amenity issues. The actual operational that will more be on the short term late side. That's probably the best way I can explain it. Mr Smith wants to add. Yeah, it's, it's maybe what we're looking at here is the principle of a short term let and the generic nature of that use. Uh, it may well be, and in, in, in Mr. Ellick might clarify that inappropriate management or individual behaviour situations could be considered through the licensing and whether or not that license was continued to be available to the party involved. But what we're looking at here is the principles behind the use of this property as a short term let rather than extrapolating out to what might happen uh, in particular situations uh, or extreme circumstances which could be dealt with through the licensing regime. Is it? I do apologise. So, theref so therefore, is it competent to um, who are so minded to bring forward a, mo uh, a motion that would only give temporary planning application until we had further details? Um, I'm not quite sure what you mean by further details, and you're looking at the principle of the use, so I'm not clear what the further details would be. Uh, if you were looking for a temporary use, you'd have to um, clearly identify why it should be a temporary use. Um, bearing in mind, if you're looking for that for amenity purposes, if you're concerned about antisocial behaviour, I don't think that would be appropriate because you've got the short term let regime. At the moment, you're looking at, I appreciate that there may be concerns about it, but you don't according to the paper, at least have any evidence before you of antisocial behaviour, etc., and the amenity issues. So therefore, in terms of looking forward, I would suggest that's much more the short term let regime rather than this. You're looking at it now for the principle of a change of use. Thank you for all those questions. Uh, I see there are no further questions this time. Uh, and Councillor James, you've jumped in with uh, a motion. You want to tell us? Thanks, Convener. Yeah, and thank you for letting me put the motion forward. Um, <clears throat> I, I think we should reject this application and for several reasons. I think Councillor McCall made some very, very good points um, earlier, Sheila, <clears throat> and all very true. Um, Dunkel's in the centre of, of my ward uh, and in fact uh, three three of us councillors and it's one of the issues that comes up time and time again um Dunkel is um depreciating if you like by its own success um everybody wants to go to Dunkel, but they only want to go there on on holiday and the people that want to buy and live there uh, can't because second homes are, are, are king um i i i this particular site, we, we only passed uh, for planning only a few years ago, quite recently uh, for residential um, and to come to us now and, and actually was rejected the first time round and it, it was passed on, on the second uh, attempt um, and to now change it before anybody's actually even got to live in it uh, as a residential unit it is uh, in my mind wrong uh, and Dun Dunkeld is 
overwhelmed with with holiday lets. Um, yes, there's a, a, a right place and a right time and what have you, but this hasn't even been used as a residential unit yet. Um, and to put a, a, what is essentially a business uh, amongst residential properties uh, in my mind is wrong. So for that reason, I was looking at uh, the adopted placemaking guide uh, and in, in particular um, page 22, which is effects on neighbouring properties. It, it, it goes against every one of those uh, issues which we're taking to consider. Uh, impact on on, on uh, internal properties and, and such like. Uh, and also, sorry, I'm, I've got it up on another screen here. Uh, policies I would reject against are, and, it, and again, I've said this several times before when we're looking at our own LDP, it, it can be interpreted in several ways. Uh, I feel sorry for our, our planning officers who I, I think have had a hard job with this one because it is a, a hot topic. Um, but I would, uh, on policy 1A, I don't think that it does respect a character and amenity of uh, the area it's in. Policy 1B, uh, paragraph A, it doesn't create a sense of identity. You've got three other properties in this building and, and you know, to put somebody in and out uh, on an as and when basis, I, I don't think is right. Policy 1BG, which uh, I don't think this does contribute to the local townscape. It detracts from the local townscape, you know, um, regardless of being a holiday destination because it is a successful holiday destination it still needs people to live and work there uh, where are these people supposed to live and work if we're going to make everything uh, a holiday let and finally uh, policy 7a um, uh, which is a policy 7a a proposal should not detract from the amenity of adjoining property especially residential think that pretty much fits the uh, the criteria. I, I know we're, we're told, oh, you know, we're, we're, it's a licensing issue uh, and, and we don't have uh, specific planning policies in place, but I think we do have specific planning policies in place and it's incumbent on us to use them prior to everybody trying to jump in before um, planning laws are changed. So I move that we reject this application. Thank you very much, convener. Do we have a seconder? Yeah, thank you. I would happily second this motion and I really have no more words to add. Ian, as Councillor James has covered all concerns, so thank you. Do we have an amendment? Bailey Williamson. My amendment is, is to um, grant the planning application, uh, but for only for a period of three years, uh, subject to the council developing a policy on introducing a control zone. Do we have a seconder for the amendment? I will second the amendment. Can I ask members if they have any comments on this report?
Councillor Leishman. Thanks very much, Convener. Yes, it's not so much a comment on the report because, as usual, it's uh, it's very in depth. So, thank you very much to our council officers for that. Um, it's more to do with uh, the topic of short-term lets. Um, I understand um, the increase in tourism that can stimulate a local economy is excellent, but there's also no doubt that short-term lets have many negative side effects. As, as we all know, reducing housing availability negatively impacting affordability as it drives uh, house prices up. And uh, it makes getting on the property ladder for many young people and many working people just totally unrealistic. So it affects, uh, in my opinion, the long term sustainability of especially our rural communities, as well as um, as well as the financialization of housing, uh, where accommodation is treated as a commodity uh, and a means of creating wealth, uh, as opposed to improving society and tackling inequality, um, just doesn't sit well with me. And the fact that there's landlords uh, that see the opportunity of, instead of charging tenants or residents £500 a month, they can then charge £500 a week, it just doesn't sit well with me. Um, so short-term lets, in my opinion, certainly put um, profit before people's needs. Um, and I think it would also be a fair assumption that uh, local residents in the Dunkeld area in this instance uh, certainly will have objections um, to the excess commercialisation of their local community. Thanks for the opportunity of the comment. Thank you. Councillor Brown, you have a comment. Uh, thanks, committee. A very brief one, um, probably following on from what Councillor Leishman has said, but uh, uh, and Mr Williamson made it clear that the, the, the legal uh, deeds uh, and the comments in there about restricting it to, to residential use don't apply to planning, and I appreciate that, but um, the spirit of this build was that it was for residential use, uh, and I would be following that, that, that course, so I'm going to be supporting the motion. Thank you. Thank you. I'll now hand over to Mr Elliott. Um, bear with me, members, but Councillor James, Councillor McLaren, I want to address the motion and I want to be quite clear exactly the policies and why you're looking to refuse. I have um, some concern in the sense of if you are, uh, and maybe take Councillor Leishman's comments as an example, is that's a comment about short term lets in general. That's a policy issue at a different level. That's for short term let control areas. Whereas you're looking at this individual flat to, to a short term let. Your difficulty with um, um, something that now addressing Councillor James and McLaren, difficulty what you said is then any future one in, in Burnham Dunkeld, you would be looking to refuse, but you don't have a short term let control area. And at the moment, you don't have that information, the data before you. Um, so, um, what a in terms of looking at this individual one, I understand comments made about the other differences, but um, a difference of differences of timing, etc. But then, what you're having to look at is why is that an issue, and do I have the evidence to say for this particular flat that that um, justifies refusal? Um, not concept, but uh, uh, sort of the evidence, if you like. Um, There's no evidence of actually even living in it yet, Colin. But that wouldn't be relevant. You've asked to look at. Yes, I fully understand it was granted. It was originally to be uh, originally permission for a residence, but you're now looking at it going to a short term left in the change. Um, there is no principle that says it must stay as residence. You're looking at what would the change, impact of the change be. OK, so I'm well, you, you, you've asked a question. I, I've, this is a huge topic with, with uh, the Community Council who formed a PH8 group and they did a lot of research into housing in Dun because of their concerns. Uh, housing shortage in Dunkeld and Burnham is, is critical. The, everything is turned over to the holiday industry, uh, so Dunkeld and Burnham is victim of its own success. I, I picked up the only because we, it's not a control zone at the minute that's coming in. It's incumbent on us that if we have the opportunity to be able to stop this uh, debt of, of uh, a small town, that we use what we do have in front of us. And I've already highlighted four policies which I've interpreted. And, and that's what I, I would go with is policy 1A, where it does not respect the character and amenity because it doesn't. Uh, it does not create a sense of identity that, you know, how can you uh, 
create an, an a sense of identity with a, a, a fluid um, a ownership or, or occupancy rather. Um, and it doesn't contribute to the local townscape. And like I said, uh, the adopted placemaking guide, page 22, um, it doesn't meet any of the criteria there. Um, that's my thoughts. And oh, policy 7A, small a, proposal should not de de detract from the amenity of an adjoining property, especially residential, which I think is important. This is a flat. There's yes, three other well, properties yeah. in that building. Oh, come on. Sorry, Carlos, games. Come on. 7A applies to business and industrial areas, so it wouldn't be relevant. So, well, it would be because this is short term let. They're, they're letting a property, it's a business. At the end of the no. day, it's a holiday business. But no, it wouldn't be in terms of in business and industrial areas. This is not a business area. Um, so, Come back from That's my point. It's residential, yeah. but it's not a. It, it's a business. The whole of Dunkeld is a business. If you if you look at the holiday industry, yeah. what I'm saying, Councillor James, I don't think policy seven is appropriate to use because I don't think it applies here. Um, but also, my other concern is that um, you have to identify and make putting, and putting forward the motion. You have to identify what's wrong with this. What, what the issues are with this individual let. Uh, whereas you are talking in general and those uh, what you've said, and I'm trying to get you to focus on this individual one uh, and the, the application before you change of use from residential flat short term late accommodation you, for this particular one. Uh, but your comments that you've made apply to any short term let and that the problem is that would then be a principle you're applying that isn't there in planning. That is in terms of controlling the numbers. Again, I'm coming back to that is more a short term like control area and you're not there yet. You might be. OK, this sure. particular one, th this is a new build. It, it was built. Uh, it, the, the first planning application was actually turned down. I was sat on it, sat on the planning committee. The first application was turned down. It, it, they resubmitted for residential units, which they got. And, and now before anybody's even moved in, uh, you know, we're desperate for, for housing in Dunkeld, but before anybody's even had the opportunity to move in and live in it, we're now letting it out as a holiday let. Um, so this one unit, it's it's inappropriate in a block of flats in the area that it's in. So yes, this specific one. Well, perhaps to deal with it the other way, Councillor James, in terms of go through your individual policies. Um, again, I've got a concern that your applying principles applies to any short term let when we're looking at this individual one. But you referred to policy 1A um, and you said, but could I clarify exactly where you feel the policy 1A is? I'll come on to the placemaking, but remind me to come on to placemaking policy later. But uh, policy 1A, what is it about the amenity of the place that will be affected that, that justifies your refusal for this individual flat? You're muted, Councillor James. Sorry, this is what I said. It's the way you interpret. Um, you know, the planning officer and I, I, I agree with the planning officers, generally speaking, but you can interpret things in many ways. Uh, I, I've interpreted, um, bear with me, because I've, I've, I've actually got it up on my screen or trying to get it up on my screen. Uh, it's here. OK. Um, the development must contribute positively to the qualify a quality of the surrounding built and natural environment. So I don't think it it, it actually uh, contributes positively with, with a transient occupancy. The design uh, and siting of the development should respect the character and amenity of the place. I don't think it does that either. It's a residential place and this doesn't uh, this doesn't contribute to the, the character and amenity of that residential property. Hey, on the last point, Councillor James, I think the design is the same. It's the use that's changing, uh, potential changing, not the actual design. So I'm not quite sure that comes in. Um, OK, delete the word but, design and put yeah. the, the siting of the development should respect the character, character and amenity. You know, it's how you interpret that, well, that's that what I'm trying to paragraph. Yeah, I'm trying to come to that, Councillor James, in terms of what at the moment what you have is you to say 
the developed must contribute positively to the quality of the built and natural environment. And we're really, I think we're talking more built environment here, if, if you agree with that. But what I'm trying to clarify is precisely why this individual application does not contribute to the built environment. What is it about this individual one? Well, I've just said the, the whole, if you read the whole paragraph and, and just take out the design, because we're not looking at the design, we're looking at the use. So forget the design, uh, uh, the siting and development should respect the character and amenity of the place. That's what I've read. It doesn't. But, but Councillor James, that is the development as a whole. Uh, what we're talking about, that's the character, the design, density and the siting of the development. Um, so you'd have to say why the development is not properly cited to bring in it the It doesn't say that in, the, money, in that. Money. It doesn't say that in the policy. It doesn't say we're looking no. at the whole of the thing. We're looking at a planning application. We look at every planning application <laughs> against the policy. Yeah. I think <laughs> the bit that we're looking at, we're not looking at the whole building. We're looking at a part of a building. If if this was a single house, we you know you you could look at it differently, but it's not. It's a flat, a residential but, flat, and I think you you can actually fit policy one a the second paragraph to the use that you're asking. Get into, get into why this individual one is not appropriate. I'm not I'm not quite I'm unable yet to kind of phrase it so that we can come to a. A terminology on the motion. That's what I'm struggling with. I'm afraid. It, so, it, are you it, saying that what I'm proposing is is not a competent motion? Well, we need. So to, we, it, we to just make, roll over and let anything go through. I no, Councillor so. James, not saying that. What I'm saying is you need to narrate the policy terms and why it is breached. And I've just I'm done that four times, Colin. No, no. I'm afraid that on, well, what you're looking at is where it, you're looking at the contribute positively to the quality of the built and sort of uh, uh, built environment. What I'm trying to clarify, you've identified that that part of 1A. We'll come on to the others, but what is it about this individual one that you feel breaches and is not positive to the built environment? OK, let, let's turn this on its head then, Colin. Our, our planning officer has uh, uh, suggested that we accept this uh, proposal and he has used in paragraph 12, the principles relevant principle relevant policies are policy 1A, placemaking. He's used it as an excuse to allow it. I'm saying my interpretation of policy 1A is different from our planning officers, and I would disagree with that. It doesn't. I, underst I understand that, Councillor James, but I'm asking you to phrase the motion so you clearly indicate why you're looking to refuse this individual. And if you bear with me a second, Mr Smith indicated that he may be able to assist, but you want to have a quick discussion this first of all. We'll OK, thank you, members. Uh, Councillor James, I appreciate that we were um, having your own clarification conversation there, but I think the issue with policy one in general is that's more to do with the form of the build. But could I direct you to policy 17 residential areas? 
Um, now, of course, within that, as you generally encouragement will be given to proposals which fall into one of the more catchy development and which are compatible with the amenity and character of the area. If you're concerned about the amenity of the area, that is more a uh, more appropriate policy to use, not placemaking policy. This one and not the Sydney either. But I'm so where we've got to at the moment. Um, if I take it further forward, is the proposal would be contrary to Perth and Cross LDP Local Development Plan Two, 2019 Policy 17 Residential Areas. Uh, uh, on the basis that as a short term let, and I'm kind of stopping there, I need you to then go further forward, James, remembering that we're looking for the for this individual one, um, not just that it's a short term let, why, what's the effect and amenity that you think it should be refused? It, it would spoil the enjoyment of a residential property for the the other residents. Um, I think a tran like I said before, a transient occup occupancy doesn't add to an amenity. It takes away, it detracts uh, for all the reasons that Councillor McCall uh, highlighted earlier. You know, different lifestyle patterns, the, the, uh, the use of the um, recycling facilities, stuff like that. Councillor James, could I? Uh, I think what you've suggested is <coughs> again specific. If you make this, you make it specific to this individual property. What it would be is proposal uh, refuse. As proposal would be contrary to Perth and Cross Local Event Plan Two, 2019 Policy 17, residential areas, on the basis that as a short term let, it would have an ad adverse impact on the yes. amenity of the neighbouring properties. Would that be what your intention would be? You put it far more eloquently than I can, Colin. Thank you. And Councillor McLaren, would you agree with that narration? Y yes, but I, you know, I'm also noting that we had no evidence to demonstrate that A, the applicant couldn't live in the property, B, they haven't um, offered it for let to the local community, which is noted in the PHA housing needs. So, you know, there's a misunderstanding of community, the community from the applicant as well. So whether that can adds any value. I appreciate what you're saying, but I think we've heard earlier on that isn't so much a relevant consideration. I think where we've got to, just to clarify for members benefit, I think where we've got to is, correct me if I'm wrong, we have a motion from Councillor James, seconded by Councillor McLaren, to refuse on the terms I outlined. And at the moment, we also have an amendment by Councillor Williamson, seconded by Councillor Masses, to grant, but with a temporary restriction on three years. Of course, I would say that, I mean, they say I have concerns on that as well, in the sense of um, this application comes before any short term let control area, so it would be a short term let. I'm not sure that it's going to be effective to put in a temporary permission, uh, but that's a matter for you putting forward that motion. Uh, sorry, amendment. Uh, do you still want to put the amendment in that way? Uh, I'm sorry, can you say that to me again, Colin? <laughs> well, trying to remember what I said. <laughs> um, my concern would be that if you put a temporary permission on it, it's still a short term let. So when you come to a control area, it's in the numbers. It is a short term let. You know, and it would become difficult for you to refuse a later one. It's the ones after that, not current ones. I can go because, of course, it's a complex picture when you're looking at short term let control areas. Um, but if you, I'm, I'm simply asking, do you still want to put forward that amendment with the limitation of three years? Uh, yes, I do. Amendment to refuse. We have the sorry motion to refuse amendment to approve for three years. Um, I think can be that uh, I've interrupted slightly early in the sense of I think we're still on summing up by the motion before we vote. Uh, can I invite Councillor James to sum up 
if he wants to. <laughs> I've probably said more than I should have done already, convener, so I'll just go to the vote. Thank you. Thank you. Members, just before you vote, just to remind you that the motion is to refuse, the amendment is to approve for three years. Members, when I call your name, if you can let me know if you are voting for the motion or the amendment. Councillor Anderson. Amendment. Councillor Braun. Motion. Councillor Cuthbert. Motion. Councillor Illingworth. Amendment. Councillor James. Motion. Councillor Leishman. Motion. Councillor McPherson. Motion. Councillor Massey. Amendment. Councillor McCall. Bailey McLaren. Motion. Councillor Reid. Motion. Sorry, Councillor Reid, was that the motion? Yes, motion. Thank you. Councillor Stewart. Amendment. And Bailey Williamson. Amendment. I have eight votes for the motion and five for the amendment, and therefore the motion will carry. Thank you. Uh, that means that the planning permission is therefore refused. Members, can I ask you, well, we want to have a break for dinner. You want to continue? Yes. OK. Well. Right, thank you. Move on to the next application, and that's for change of use, alterations and extension to shop to form four flats at 20, 29 Reform Street, Blair Gowry. And to introduce the report is Mr Williamson. Thank you. Thank you again, convener. The next two applications today relate to the same property, with the first application relating to the creation of a total of four one bedroom flats within the property last used as a shop and to which a new extension would be erected. Next slide, please. The aerial image shows the location of the site just to the south of Blair Gowrie Town Centre, yet within the town's conservation area. The property is located at the midpoint of Reform Street at its junction with Union Street. Gasbury is approximately 90 metres to the east, while Perth Road is around 110 metres to the west. Next slide, please. Next, we see the proposed site plan. The main original part of the application property is delineated with the thicker walls to the north of the site, while the hatched red footprint shows the area of single storey rear extension, which would be demolished. In its place would be a two-storey rear extension tagged onto the back of the retained traditional building. 
pedestrian access would be taken from the east elevation in the communal area between numbers 29 and 31 Reform Street. Areas for bike and bin storage would also be provided within this area. To the south, outlined in blue, would be retained in the applicant's control. Next slide, please. Members will now see the proposed elevations, which sees the retention of the original part of the site, which would be comprehensively uh, refurbished, including repointing with lime mortar and refurbished slate roofing. The new extension to the rear has been stepped beneath the ridge line of the original part and would be finished with lime render to clearly delineate the change between old and new. In addition, some of the old openings would be built up and new openings creating conservation roof lights would be incorporated into the proposal. Next slide, please. Next, we see the proposed floor plans of these four one bedroom flats with two on the ground and two on the first floor. All would be accessed from the communal area to the east of the building. This slide also illustrates how the footprint of the extension is less than half of the existing single storey extension. Next slide, please. Lastly, in respect of plans, we see the details of the proposed timber windows, which would provide uniformity across this development and thereby help to preserve and improve the character of this building within the conservation area. We now move on to a slide of photographs to give a feel for the application property. First, we see a street view extract of the building frontage while still in use as a shop. As members shall note, it's in particularly poor condition. Union Street runs to the right hand side of the building, while the communal area lies immediately to the left. Next slide, please. These next two photos show the communal area to the side where pedestrian access would be taken, as well as where cycle and bin storage would be provided. In the right hand photo, the property on the left is 31 Reform Street, together with its associated garage and side access. Next slide, please. These next photos show the street view from Union Street with the heavy use of cement mortar on repairs to the original part, together with the latter single storey extension. To this elevation, there would be no gable windows in the original part, although the new extension would see windows to the lobby and toilet at ground floor level and conservation roof lights serving the same areas at first floor level. Next photo, please. This next photo shows the view southwards in Union Street and illustrates how the pavement only exists on the opposite side of the road. Next photo, please. And this last photo provides a zoomed in aerial extract to show the relationship of the application property to that around it, together with a final street view extract of the former shop frontage. Thank you, convener. That now concludes my presentation and I'll leave members with the proposed site plan for reference. Uh, thank you, Mr Williamson. We have deputations on this item. Uh, I'll pat now pass over to the Vice Convener for deputations. Thank you. Thank you, Convener. Uh, could we call the first deputation, Ms Wallace, please. Ms Wallace, as you make your way up, you've got 10 minutes to make your deputation. I'll give you a prompt after nine minutes so you could sum up over the last minute and I'll start the clock whenever you're ready. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, with regard to this development, I would like to highlight a material planning consideration that does not appear to have been addressed and included in the report of handling by the Head of Planning and Development, which is report number 2393 for this planning application. In the objection from 31 Reform Street, concern was expressed on the matter of overlooking and privacy to the property and garden. The garden at the property 31 Reform Street has never been overlooked and this application has not pro protected the property from this. The boundary is not of a sufficient distance away to meet the overlooking requirements set out in the place making policy. The impact of the current single storey rear building being replaced with a double storey building with windows overlooking 31 Reform Street means that the windows from the rear upper flat will overlook the garden of this property. Further, policy 17 is not met, in, not met in terms of protecting 
the existing residential amenity with regard to this. In the report 2393 under residential amenity, point 42 in particular, it's misleading as it states the main outlook from the new building is to the south, away from the street and neighbouring properties, and that loss of amenity by reason of overlooking is therefore not a concern. I have to add that no street name is given in this statement, but I am presuming it's Union Street. It is, however, a concern to the property of 31 Reform Street. The current building proposed for demolition, which is single storey, has roof lights, which do not cause overlooking of 31 Reform Street. But this will change if a double storey is built and the rear upper flat living room window and other windows will overlook 31 Reform Street. I also have another comment to make on the amenity um, passageway or road between 29 and 31. The blue shaded communal area cannot be considered outside space for the new development and instead is a servitude right of 24 hour vehicular and pedestrian access for number 31. We think this is misleading in the drawings. Whilst I believe there are a number of unresolved planning issues with this proposal, I particularly highlight the overlooking, um, which has been inaccurately disregarded and reported on in report number 2393. As this remains a material planning issue with the current proposal, I hope the committee will take this into account in their decision making today. That's all I have to say. Are you willing to take questions from members? Give me a second, I'll see if there's any questions. Can I ask members to submit questions for Ms Wallace? There appears to be no questions, Ms Wallace, so you're free to go. Okay, so now calling Ms Smith and, and supported by Ms Casey. I believe it's only yourself, Ms Smith, that's making a deputation and Ms Casey, you're going to take questions with Ms Smith. Is that correct? Whenever you're ready, we'll, we'll start the timer. Hi there, um, my name's Adele and I'm a resident at number 13 Union Street. This is Adeline who is, um, her family business is next door to me. Um, and basically I have no, had none of us have had any experience of council procedures or anything like that. And we do find it quite daunting for one thing and very confusing. Um, and so, Basically, we we find that the proposals um, are, that we for the change of use for the um, putting into the four single room flats um, and the um, also the de demolition, which is I think in the next bit, but they do overlap and it's very difficult to uh, distinguish between the two. Um, the even the um, planning officer had difficulties with that as well with writing his report. I've read all that and I've read, um, you know, the recommendations as well. I would just like to, like, uh, one of the main objections for us is the um, lack of parking and space um, with the development. Um, at the moment, the, if, um, the, it's very congested on Union Street, Reform Street, William Street, and there is very limited parking because of double light yellow lines and um, it's also quite a small lane. Um, now, I, it has been said that the, the you know, the provide, the, the council provides the parking, uh, car parks and things like that further into the town. Um, but for some people, uh, myself included, but being disabled, it's is more difficult, um, and that wouldn't be an option for me. And I do have um, issues surrounding disability, 
as in um, it doesn't seem to be a very um, a very level playing field, to be honest with you, because this um, flat development doesn't seem to be open for everybody, which I know that it's not suitable for some people, i.e. people with families, but it is should be suitable for disabled people as well as um, you know, professional people or, um, you know, uh, sorry, I've forgotten the name, the one, uh, social housing. I, we've no idea what this is going to develop into for one thing. Um, so um, we're, we're just bringing these, hi highlighting these, these, but the parking is a huge issue. Um, and there is, you know, limited parking. They did mention um, in, the, in the plan and application that there was, um, on Reform Street, there's the the uh, cinema, the old cinema that has been picture house court has been um, done like this, and they did provide parking. Now I do realise things do change, but the need for people to have a choice is also shouldn't be changed. So there is some things you can help, um, you know, uh, uh, facilitate, but you can't just put things into place at the detriment of other people, mainly for us, the, the, the neighbourhood around this development. Um, and the, the other issues I'm bringing up about for other neighbours is really the, they're being overlooked, although that has been discussed in the development officer's report. Um, but even at that, the, the church spire is quite is further down to do a, a, one of the light um, uh, surveys, but that's not, um, obviously that's not any, I have no idea about anything like that. So I would take what he said as, as being right, but it's just very disappointing for especially that family and um, other ones. Um, also, there's a problem with if they, if they do do get permission and they do start the development, is the um, a potential closure of Union Street that's going to cause problems for not only um, you know access for like some myself who I'm a mum who's 84 and not the best, um, and other ones on the street. It's not you know it's not it's it's going to cause us real problems, um, and also the the businesses. Now that's where Adeline comes in. And her, um, you know, her business, the business will be impacted because there is no place um, short term will be impacted because they can't get deliveries in if the road's closed. And also if there is, um, you know, a, any kind of um, a, work to be done, the lorries coming through is very small lane. Now, we, we don't know what the, the details are of that at all, and we don't know for how long it'll last for. Um, and that's a big issue because it does impact on their financial um, well-being of the, their, their business. Now, the other thing is that there's a few um, things that aren't right in the application. They've shown that in the pre-application um, things <laughs> that are uh, noted, um, on the, the the report from the planning officer, it does say that there's been previous pe things, uh, people who, are, who have asked about the, the building and the, uh, and as the first two seem to have been told that they need a structural, re re um, a structural survey, which I would have thought, although they say it's not mandatory, I would have thought it would be essential for this because this is dependent on the, the demolition of part of a building um, and what is the effect of that on the building that they're going to be converting. Um, and so that in itself, I think, is, is should have been, now I know there's been an archaeological report being requested by uh, the planning officer, but that doesn't include the structural survey as far as I'm led to believe. Um, and the the point with the structural survey, uh, uh, the, there's three out, um, areas that have been asked, conservation, um, uh, heritage and his, historical um, 
team, they've been they've been asked for opinions and they can't give a a, an, an, a real informed answer because there is there's no evidence to say that there's there's the outwardly there is that there's damage to the the building, but there's nothing to say that there's any problem. Um, you, well, don't get me wrong, it's, it is in poor condition, we all agree with that. And we are not against any kind of, um, you know, uh, repair of the building or if it is demolition, but it would, that has to be a last resort. You can't just, it's a historical building. It can't just be hauled down when you've no evidence for it. If there was evidence, then it, it, absolutely, if that's if for safety reasons, for one thing, but it has to be evidenced. And I can't see evidence there because there's not a structural report. Um, and I also um, think that there's, so that's one of the big issues. Another is the, the amount of changing it from commercial to um, residential. There, again, where's the, 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 they've noted some areas that were vacant at that time. Um, it, I have done a wee top up today and there is two that are vacant at this moment and from the ones that were mentioned and w one of those is well there's three there's one well there's one that's vacant and it was refused planning the other is vacant waiting on uh, the planning was was approved and it's just waiting it's got it's tenants, they're waiting to, to finish that procedure off. Um, and then the other one has been, yep, has been, um, oh, sorry, you've put me off. <laughs> uh, and the other one is, has, is still vacant, but that's different to what we've been said, uh, has been said. And I, um, basically, I, I would like some clarification where, where possible on these things, if that's okay. Is that okay? Oh, sorry. Thank you for your deputation. Are you willing to take questions from members if there's any? Yes, I'm happy. And you? Members, could you please submit questions? There appears to be no questions, so you're free to go. Thank you very much. Could I now please call on Mr McGregor and Mr Brash. Um, you both have 10 minutes. Um, I, I don't know if you're wanting just one deputation or two. Just do a single. Uh, so I'll give you a wee prompt after uh, nine minutes to give you a sum up in the last minute uh, in your own time. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak with regards to both applications. Um, there exists a significant number, a significant and rising number of vacant commercial properties within the centre of Blair Gowrie and in the wider context Perth and Kim Ross. Towns due to the impact of COVID-19 pandemic, significant decrease in footfall to town centres and as well publicised the ever increased cost of living. In spite of attempts to sell the occupying business as a going concern or secure commercial let for the building, that has been unsuccessful and is now scheduled for closure and vacancy. As stated prior, this pattern aligns with innumerable commercial properties within the immediate and wider area. The applicant's intent is to convert and extend the existing building to bring it into use for the purposes of four one-bedroom flats. The ability to change the use classification and convert the application site aligns with Perth and Kinross Council's continuing drive to diminish the number of vacant properties whilst enhancing the number and available availability of much-needed homes, especially one-bedroom. In particular, the proposals present are fully considered in accord with PKC's 2022-2027 Local Housing Strategy, which states everyone in Perth and Kinross has access to the right home in the right place at the right cost. Intent is to provide more affordable homes to support livable and sustainable communities. 
and deliver more homes for people with varying needs. Indeed, the proposals are supported by Perth and Cronos Council Vacant Property Grant Award support, together with potential future applications, pending application success for the Adapt Your Property Grant. In alignment with the local housing strategy, the flats could serve as the following. A single person or a young couple seeking a small affordable residence, an elderly person seeking an affordable property with critical and direct pedestrian access to local services, amenities within walking distance, or those that are serviced by pre-existing public transport and not requiring the use of a vehicle. The application site proposals benefited from direct consultation with development management via pre-application with consideration of the content such as residential amenity, parking, alternative modes of transport, scale, massing, materials, etc. fully undertaken and these recommendations transferred to the current planning application submissions. In conclusion, given the intent for the creation of much, this much needed type of housing that accords with the local housing strategy plan, vacant property support, constructive and positive impact to an eminently vacant and unkempt building, a scale and character that respects the environment of the town and conservation area, the proximity of sustainable modes of transport, provision of a travel management plan, no adverse impact on residential amenity of surrounding properties, it's hoped that the decision of the case officers can be supported. As a footnote, we acknowledge the comments made by the prior deputation, and in response to these, I provide the following. With regards to the overlooking and privacy, this was discussed at length with the delegated officer at the time. The initial application was subsequently withdrawn and alterations made to then demonstrate compliance. PKC's policy is to have a nine metre distance from windows to adjacent boundaries we are overlooking as a potential issue, and this consideration is met. This was discussed at length with the delegated officer during the redesign phase, considered acceptable and confirmed in writing. With regards to the comment on parking, this matter has been fully addressed through the applications and through the significant consultation with roads and parking, and their support is acknowledged. A travel management plan identified the existence of ample on-street parking together with public parking all cited with an immediate proximity of the site. Thank you. Thank you. Are you willing to take questions from members? I could I ask members to submit questions, please? Councillor Cuthbert. Thank you, Vice Convener. Yeah, um, thank you for your presentation. Um, just looking at the, what you're planning to do, you're taking down the back third of the building roughly. Um, what I couldn't understand is why that's shown as being um, allotment grounds and why that couldn't have been converted into parking area for the, the, the converted buildings that you're converting. Yeah, certainly. I, at present, the ground is um, it's used as occasional storage for a local contractor's firm, so it's actually let out separately from the building at present. And what the intention was, was during the construction phase was to effectively utilise that to minimise any disruption to the neighbours, any surrounding properties to then utilise that for the storage of materials, site welfare, deliveries, all those sorts of things. And then effectively in the future, it would then be a case of reletting it as occasional storage for, for, um, for a tenant, you know, for example, the construction firm that uses it. Thank you for that. Councillor Ellingworth. Great, thank you. Is is the shop actually empty at the moment? Moment. Sorry, it's not actually empty at the moment, but it's scheduled for closure. Yeah, gentlemen, there appears to be no further questions. You're free to go. Uh, the committee thanks all the deputations. Are there are no further deputations. I'll hand you back to the convener. Uh, thank you, Vice Convener. Thank you to the deputations. Uh, can I ask members, do they have any questions for officers? Councillor James. <laughs> Sorry, convener. Um, thanks. 
uh, convener for allowing me to ask. Um, parking is a massive issue uh, where this building is. It, it's, uh, you know, on, on a very, very busy junction, the, you know, the, the car parks are down the road. Uh, what was the thinking behind not asking for parking? I know you say there's parking close by, but in all honesty, it's not that close and not convenient at all. Um, so what was the thinking behind not uh, asking for parking, please? Thank you very much, Councillor James. Uh, obviously, first and foremost, you know, we consider the proposals that are tabled before us uh, in this instance it is four small one bed flats, uh, obviously as part of the climate change agenda. Uh, we are obviously looking to discourage the use of the private car in some circumstances, so not everybody who's looking for a small property would necessarily want to have uh, a car or would necessarily need one. It's obviously well sited uh, with excellent walking linkages down to public transportation uh, within Blair Gowrie uh, as well. Uh, but obviously we've consulted with our colleagues within transportation as well, who are similarly satisfied that provision of on street facilities in the vicinity uh, would be able to accommodate anything that, that might arise from, from this development. Thank you. There appears to be no further questions unless my computer is slow again. No, no further questions. Can I ask for a motion? Bailey Williamson. Um, convener, I'd like to approve the application. Okay. Councillor Illingworth, second in the motion. Yep, I'm happy to second the motion. Councillor James, you have an amendment. Surprise, surprise. Um, yes, I do, Convener, and mine would be to reject it um, on the grounds that I, I've just uh, sort of intimated on the parking. I know it's our aspiration to, to prevent parking. The fact of the matter is you won't stop it. People will park. And I think that by having no parking facility at, at that property, which is on a hugely busy junction, um, I think you'll only be um, creating problems um, further down the road. Uh, so I, I would much rather see a, um, a, a project which is perhaps a, a little bit smaller, but did include parking. Um, so that, that's why I would um, go for a rejection. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have a seconder for the amendment? Billy McLaren. Yeah, thank you. I'm happy to second. I too feel that I um, concur with Councillor James uh, regarding parking. It would be an issue and it's um, wrong of us not to maybe recognise that with four properties uh, proposed. Right, thank you. I'll now hand over to Mr Elliott. Thank you, Convener. At the moment, we have a motion to approve by Councillor Rollingsman, seconded by Councillor Illingworth, and an amendment to refuse. And I want to um, articulate the amendment to refuse. Uh, now, Councillor James and Councillor McCarran, I would direct you to policy 60B, I think it is, uh, subsection C, um, new development proposals. And all development proposals, including small scale proposals, should see incorporate appropriate levels of parking provision not exceeding the maximum parking standards laid out. No, it says in the SPP that has been superseded, of course. Um, so I think the terms of your motion to refuse would be a refusing uh, proposal uh, being contrary to Perth and Gross Local Development, development Plan 2 2019, Policy 60B, Subdivision C. Transport standards and accessibility requirements, uh, new development proposals, as the proposal does not incorporate appropriate levels of parking provision. Uh, in doing so, I draw your attention, uh, and I'm not going to say your motion's incompetent, uh, but I draw your uh, attention to National Planning Framework 4, where it encourages 20 minute neighbourhoods. And also, there's a policy on uh, um, sustainable transport policy 13, where there's a specific policy 13E 
development proposals which are ambitious in terms of low, no car, car parking will be supported, particularly in urban locations which are well served by sustainable transport modes. And of course, National Planning Framework 4 came in after your LDP, so you do have to take that into account. Um, so looking at Councillor James and Bailey McLaren, does that correctly narrate your motion, sorry, your amendment to refuse? Very eloquent, yeah. Colin. Thank you. Mr. Wilson, you want to clarify a point that's in the report? Yes, it was just in relation to condition three as uh, as tabled, which relates to uh, the provision of the archaeological standing building survey. Um, just to flag that the wording within that requires uh, to be amended ever so slightly, uh, just in respect of the uh, the wording saying that the uh, the scope of the standing building survey will be agreed by ourselves in liaison with Perth and Kinross Heritage Trust. Um, so in, in effect, it doesn't really change what's being sought. The timing of it is just the wording of it. So it's just to make sure that, that Bailey Williamson uh, and Councillor Ellingworth would be, be happy with uh, the motion being subject to, to that uh, tweak of the condition. You have to. Sorry, if I could come in. Sorry, come here. If I should have raised it because it was me that spotted this. But it's a technical change because any condition is enforceable only by the planning authority. So it doesn't change the terms of your uh, uh, motion to approve. It's a technical change to make sure it's approval. That's approved by Perth Cross Council, the planning authority in consultation with Perth and Cross Heritage Trust. It has to be flipped around a bit. It's not done by PKHT. It's done by planning authority in consultation with PKHT. It's a technical legal change. Are you comfortable with it? Yeah. So we now move on to sum up. Uh, Bailey Williamson, do you want to sum up? Uh, no, thank you. Right, I'll now hand back to Mr Elliott. Um, just to be clear, members, the motion by Bailey Williamson, seconded by Councillor Ringworth, is to approve uh, with the slight amendments to the report. The amendment is to refuse uh, in terms of the, the lack of parking provision. That's by Councillor James and Bailey McLaren. Members, when I call your name, if you can let me know if you are voting for the motion or the amendment. Councillor Anderson. Motion. Councillor Cuthbert. Motion. Councillor Illingworth. Motion. Councillor James. Amendment. Councillor Leishman. Motion. Councillor McPherson. Motion. Councillor Massey. Motion. Councillor McCall. Motion. Bailey McLaren. Amendment. Councillor Reid. Amendment. Councillor Stewart. Motion. Bailey Williamson. Motion. I have nine votes for the motion and three for the amendment and therefore the motion will carry. Thank you. With the motion carrying, then planning permission is therefore granted, subject to condition in the report of handling. Thank you. OK, we're moving on now. Uh, this is for part demolition of building 29 Reform Street, Lear Gowrie. And to introduce the report is Mr Williamson. Thank you again, convener. Uh, as I alluded to in the presentation for the previous application, this local application relates to the same property at 29 Reform Street. However, this proposal is for conservation area consent for the part demolition of the existing property as previously confirmed. Next slide, please.
Thank you very much. Uh, again, this aerial image shows the location of the site just to the south of Blair Gowrie Town Centre, yet within the, the town's conservation area. Um, next slide, please. Next, we see the proposed site plan. The main original part of the property is delineated with thicker walls to the north of the site, while the hatched red footprint shows the area of the single storey rear extension, which would be demolished. Next slide, please. In comparison, this slide shows the existing site plan with the elongated single storey annex running down Union Street, which would be demolished. Um, next slide, please. Uh, these are the existing elevations, which shows the single storey rear extension, which would be demolished in order to make way for the extension proposed as part of the application for planning permission. We now move on to some of the slides for photographs uh, to familiarise members with the site again. Next slide. Again, this is the, the frontage to Reform Street, as we've seen before. Next slide. This is the communal area uh, to the side uh, with uh, the existing building uh, retained. Next slide, please. Uh, again, this is the views from Union Street showing the section to be retained on the left and then the right hand side is the demolition that would form part of this proposal. Next slide, please. This is the view southwards down Union Street, again showing that the pavement only exists on the western side. Next slide, please. Uh, and then we just return to the site layout plan for reference. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Williamson. Uh, the deputations on this item, uh, I'll hand over to the vice convener to introduce the deputations. Thank you. Can I call on Ms. Wallace? Ms. Wallace, again, 10 minutes for your deputation. I'll give you a prompt after nine minutes. Um, Just for the benefit of members and for the benefit of all the deputations, we have the same deputations on this application as we had on the last application. Uh, members obviously heard what you said last time, so you don't need to repeat everything that was said last time. Um, just bear in mind on this one, you're dealing with the partial demolition in, in a conservation area. That's the focus here. So it's a matter for you what you, you say, but bear in mind there's a slightly different focus here. OK, well, I would have just said the same again. Unfortunately, I don't need to. Um, my only comment really is um, why have a conservation area when it just appears that people can demolish buildings um, Willy nilly without any archaeological survey being done or a structural survey has not been done to the property. Are you going to take questions from members? Members, could you submit questions? There appears to be no questions, Ms. Wells. You're free to go. Could I call on Ms. Smith and Ms. Casey? I'm sure you heard what uh, Mr. Elliot said about. Re Mr. Elliot was uh, giving a prompt about not repeating. Obviously, we're hearing about the same um, property, so. We're talking about the demolition rather than doing your whole submission from the last time. Does that can it make sense? I'll do my best, but it is very tight. <laughs> the boundaries. Anyway, sorry. Thank you again for listening. Um, I, now, this is me. I bought my cottage in Union Street, believing there wasn't to be any building opposite. Um, I got a due diligence, diligence and got the deeds for the properties round about, seeing what was mutual, what wasn't mutual, etc. And obviously, um, the, the deed from what you've discussed earlier in another in another proposal it is a legal matter. Um, but the the deed is very very clear on what is allowed and what's not. There's also been amendments to that deed um, that has, um, you know, about 
communal area. Um, but the, the the whole thing with this this de demolition is again. I'm sorry, but it has to be said that there is no evidence. There's not even photographs of the inside of the building that shows it dilapidated. Um, it's still being used as a storage. It's the front of this the shop is still being used as um, a a shop. They're running a business from it. I'm sure that health and safety have okayed all that. So how is it now? It is um, needing to be demolished. For me, that's a big thing. It's got historical significance, the age of the building, it's one of the oldest. There's nothing to say that monetary wise, how much it would cost to do the, the, the building up. There's no nothing, nothing is provided. So how have they got, how is there a back into that when, like, en oh, whenever I've read anything, it's got to be that you've to have the evidence. There's no evidence. There's no, um, like they usually do a report to say how much it would cost. There's none of that. Um, now there is, um, as I say, there is the archaeology report, but that's not, you know, it, it's it's the structural. You, you, you don't take somebody's word that something is coming down. You need the evidence. There is none. Um, and I'm not saying it's not there. It's just not. It's they've not provided it. I'm not saying it's not right. We've just have never seen it. So how can the um, conservation? How can the um, historical um, team and the other one, which I can't remember the name of, the three teams that were what was this? Can I hear you? Sorry. Uh, how can how can name? They make a decision on the demolition when there is no evidence. There's like the outside does look run down. There's no doubts. The, there is, there is, but there are some buildings that, well, they're, they're not the best looking, but they can be changed, can be adapted. Uh, but and they have all said that demolition is the last resort. It needs to be. Um, like it's it's and yeah it's getting torn down. Our, our very much big concern is of what goes in there. There could have been gardens. That's what it's meant to be for. There there is um, it's meant to be an um, an amenity for the building that's there. Um, and yet there is n there is we are worried on what will go on that ground. If they're not putting parking in, they're not putting gardens in, which obviously helps with with the health of, um, you know, mental health of people, gardening, etc. Your, your, um, even your, your diet. There's, there's great pluses in gardening. But this is not even, it's not considered. But what is going in that space is a huge concern for us. Because there's nothing. There's nothing to say what's going in. You don't just have the space and do nothing with it. You would be hauling a, a garden, uh, sorry, a, a building down for nothing. And it's got these historical significance. It was the REF A um, meeting halls. It was the church, Christian church meeting hall. It was. It, but none of that is seems to be significant. It's just, but there's to me, there's not anything that that is evident that that needs to be hauled down. And so for that, I definitely object. Is that okay? <laughs> Are you willing to take questions from members? If there's, can I call members to submit questions? There appears to be no questions. You're free to go. Can I call on Mr. McGregor and Mr. Brash? Gentlemen, you've got uh, 20 minutes, 10 minutes each, but uh, yeah, OK. And again, just to remind you, it's about the demolition Thank you, in your own time. Thank you. 
Uh, during the course of the feasibility study, the retention of the, the wing at the back was considered. Um, subsequent to that, we did have an initial structural survey carried out, which was a, a visual on-site inspection and a physical inspection. And through the course of that inspection, it was deemed that there was, in terms of the remedial works, etc., it was not that it was prohibitively expensive, but it was expensive. Um, through also the course of the consultation with the conservation officer, we did actually discuss the demolition at length, and again, there was no objection to that. Hence the reason that we moved forward with the, the proposals as they currently stand. Thank you. Willing to take questions from members? Can I call members to submit questions? Councillor Cuthbert. Hello, thank you. It's me again. Um, I'm actually getting a wee bit confused here. Uh, in terms of what you're actually proposing to demolish, is it the whole of the back, back section, the sort of the single story, or is it just a half of that roughly? Sorry, it's the entirety of the back section. That's correct. There appears to be no further questions, gentlemen, so you're free to go. Uh, can I thank all the deputations? There are no further deputations. I'll hand back to the convener. Uh, thank you, Vice Convener. Thank you for the deputations again. Uh, can I ask members if they have any questions for officers? Councillor James. <laughs> Wouldn't have expected anything else, convener. Eh? <clears throat> thank you. Uh, my question again is around the conservation area, and, and the, the, the lady that made the deputation makes a very valid point. You know, uh, what was the reasoning behind wanting to demolish a building? Had this building been in somewhere like Dunkeld or whatever, we, we get them to incorporate it into anything new. And I'm just wondering why. You know, we weren't, uh, or this wasn't a consideration for this um, proposal. Thank you very much, Councillor James. Um, I think how I would answer that would be to obviously reflect the fact that yes, from a standing or our starting point, yes, retention would generally be the best solution uh, in taking these matters forward. There is an element of commercial viability that will come into it as well to ascertain whether or not you know what can be achieved. Is, is viable for the applicants going forward. Obviously, in this case, the long nature of the, the elongated building, it's unlisted. Um, yes, there is a history behind it, and that's been reflective of, of previous correspondence that we've had with Historic Environment Scotland and our own conservation officers, but we have to make a, a balanced judgment as to uh, whether or not something is of such a value that it's sacrosanct uh, and, and should be protected at all costs. In this instance, as I say, it's not listed. And what we have here is a, a proposal to demolish this section uh, to help enable the development that we've previously considered as part of the, the previous application. So it's a finely balanced one in this instance. Yes, ordinarily we would want to, to seek retention of traditional or vernacular buildings, but in this instance that it's outweighed by the, the benefits that would arise from the provision of, of four uh, housing units uh, in, in balance. Yeah, I'd maybe just add a supplemental to that. And if we look back at the presentation that we had, you know, this rear extension has been significantly altered over a number of years, and particularly the elevation that fronts onto the street uh, as modern uh, clad material. Uh, it's only aspects of other elevations that, that has the more random rubble appearance to it. Uh, and overall, we don't feel that the building is so important that it should be retained and incorporated into a revised design uh, and that the proposals before us are supportable. Thank you. There seems to be no further questions. Can I give a second for that? No. OK, can I ask for a motion? Yeah. 
I've just been informed that the the revised condition is the same for this one as it was one for the one before. Condition three, is it? Two, sorry, two. OK, Councillor Ellingworth, motion. Yeah, my, my motion would be to to move the paper as it is with with the slight amendment from the officers. Um, I think this whole development will bring a little bit of life back into a small part of Blair Gallery, which looks pretty run down. So, um, so I'm happy to to move the motion. Bailey Williamson, you second the motion. Thank you. Do we have an amendment? Do we have any comments on the report? Councillor Reid, you were trying to second the motion. Will you, do you wish to make a comment? No, no, that's fine. Thank Sorry. you. It's just too slow, as usual. <laughs> Thank you. So the application is approved as amended and subject to the condition in the report of Hadland. Thank you. Right now we move on to the plan applications. Uh, before uh, I ask members for comments, uh, I, Mr Panton wishes to advise regarding the two plans. Thank you, convener. Yes, whilst it's not normal practice to do an introductory presentation for the proposal of application notices, um, I thought it was considered appropriate to do so here just to avoid confusion. Um, so you'll notice that there are two pans on the agenda today, and both of these are for Murray's Hall and appear to be duplicates. Um, however, they are slightly different. One of them includes residential development, the other one does not. Um, the agent has done this on purpose because they're still not sure on the detailing of their final scheme. So by submitting two different pans, that will allow them um, to proceed either way. Um, so it was just a point of clarity as to why we've got two that kind of look the same. Can I ask if members have any comments? Bailey McLaren. Thank you, convener. Yeah, but both these um, potential applications uh, have will have uh, change the whole outlook aspect of the area of Murray's Hall. There is a huge amount of local enjoyment of the area. Um, when I was up there driving past there the other day, uh, you know, there's people walking on the road, there's cyclists, um, but this is really going to make a big change, potentially make a, a big change to the whole area for the local community of Schoon as well. So great um, thought should be given to how that, how the local community are incorporated into this um, proposal and their, their local enjoyment not um, constrained in the future. Thank you for that, Bailey McCann. Any more comments? No more comments. Well, that's the end of business for today. Thank you all. Thank you all the officers. Thank every, all the deputations. Thank everyone for the meeting. Thank you. You're all free to go. Thanks, convener.